On today's episode of Mile Higher, we got the opportunity to have Jelani's mother and brother. Jelani Day, an Illinois State University grad student, went missing a month ago. Jelani, he was very good at speaking passionately about whatever he felt like was his opinion or what he felt like was right. That night when I called him and it went to the voicemail, that wasn't what alarmed me. What alarmed me was when I never got a phone call back from him. Carmen Day has accused the Bloomington police of dragging their feet when she first reported Jelani missing. When you assume that the police are doing something, it, it's almost a risk to assume that because there's a there's a good chance that they're not actually doing those things mm -hmm. that they need to do. It's been almost two years. If anybody needs to be angry, it's me. We're happy to help. We want to see justice for Jelani. He said, OK, Mom, I just wanted to hear your voice. I talked to you in the morning. That was the last time I talked to him. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about Jelani Day, which many of you may remember when I covered his case back in 2021. I'm sure many of you have heard of Jelani's case. Today is going to be a little different because we got the opportunity to have um, Save and Carmen Day here with us, Jelani's mother and brother. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for having us. They're going to be able to give us so much more insight into the case, really correct the record as there's been a lot of misinformation out there. And we've kind of put together an action plan so that you guys can help because this family still needs help desperately. And Jelani Day to this, to this day has had no justice and it's been extremely hard on you guys. Um, the toll that it's taken on your family and the efforts that you've been putting in throughout the years have been extraordinary, but you need help. And that's where all of you can come in and really make a difference today. Um, before we get started, would you guys mind just giving a little background on yourselves and where you're from? I'm Carmen um, Bolden Day. I'm Jelani's mom. We um, are from Danville, Illinois. Um, me and his dad, Save Sr., um, we settled there in 1992, um, where we had our started having children, and we, that's where we planted our seeds and had our family. Um, Save. Um, this is my. He's the third child that we had. Um, he's the second oldest son. Um, Jelani's big brother. Um, we just want to come on here with you today and to help spread the word um, that we do need help um, to ask for things and to clear the record about some things that have been out there and to update you on what is going on with Jelani's case currently. Yes, and I'm, I'm Save Day, um, Jelani's older brother. Like she said, uh, I'm from Danville also, of course. Um, and uh, I really appreciate being here with you guys today and the fact that you covered it last year as well. Um, and we just want to keep on assisting us where we can and hopefully you guys can continue to give, give us the help yeah well we appreciate you guys making the trek all the way out here um and and being with us today i mean it's not easy for them to go over all this information over and over again and you shouldn't have to do this it's really the failure of the police and the media to get the case out and you know reach as many people as possible but you know you guys have t had to take on a lot on your own that you shouldn't have to do and it's it's been amazing to see how far you guys have come and how much work you have put in throughout the years. But I know it has taken a toll. Yeah, it's hard. But um, as I said, that's my son. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make sure that um, I need to know what happened to him. I need to know um, why it happened to him. And I need to make sure that the people that did this to him or the person, whomever, is held responsible. Yes, that's the ultimate goal. Before we get started, I wanted to mention a few ways that you guys can help. And you have all been so amazing in the past with assisting families. And today is definitely a time where you can be an active true crime consumer and take those extra steps to help this family. Um, there are several ways that you can help. 
we have put together a merchandise campaign. You can purchase two t-shirts actually are available. Um, and the proceeds from these t-shirts will go to the Jelani Day Foundation, which do you guys want to start by explaining more about the foundation and your goals with that? Um, the Jelani Day Foundation is a foundation that um, I formed that will help assist and um, provide resources to families of missing people of color. Um, and the reason that we chose this is because of the disparity that the families have to face. Uh, and I want to be able to help people the way that I was helped. And I'm still being helped. Um, I want Jelani to make an impact and a difference to help other families. Um, if they need anything, then we are capable of providing that assistance or those resources. I want to be able to be for us to be able to do that for them. So that's the premise of what the foundation is about. Mm -hmm. And you guys also want to offer resources to families over time to kind of give them a guide about what to do if they end up in this situation themselves, because so many don't know what first steps to take. And I mean, how would you until you're in that situation, you're kind of, you know, having to figure out things as you go. Absolutely. Um, I'm not an expert in this, mm -hmm. but with what I've had to do, I, the intent is to create a playbook is what I'm calling it. And it's to help pe people you know, when they're searching for their loved ones to give them a guide and a reference as to what to do if they haven't covered those steps already, um, to give them um, some sort of idea of things that you should cover, people that you should contact, mm -hmm. um, things that you should know. Just from my experience of alo alone, not that my experience, like I said, not that it's an expertise experience, but the things that I've learned or the things that I have knowledge of, I don't mind sharing so that it may be able to help another family and make it easier for them and probably lead to them finding their loved one quicker. Mm -hmm. I mean, Especially when dealing with law enforcement. Yeah. Yes. Because that's, if you're not familiar with this case, law enforcement drew, it seems, drew conclusions that don't make any sense and therefore valuable time was used up when they could have been searching for Jelani mm -hmm. and they could have potentially found him much sooner had they done simple things. And as you went through this experience, in hindsight, you realized a lot of different things that you would have done or would have asked of law enforcement initially when this all s sort of happened, right? Yeah. Initially, I... um. When going through this, I was um, hesitant about asking things or about saying things or about wanting them to do things because I didn't want them not to help me. I didn't want them to look at, okay, this angry black woman is giving, these, giving us these demands or, and telling us how to do our job. Um, I wanted to show them that I was being cooperative um, in hindsight. I wish I would have been more assertive. Um, I wish I would have been more demanding because it would have made a difference. It would have made a huge difference. Um, I think I would have had better results had I not been hesitant or scared to do those things. Mm -hmm. I encourage families not to second guess themselves, that if they feel there's something that needs to be looked at. If they feel that there's something that needs to be done, make sure that your voice is heard. Make sure that you let the police or let whoever that you're working with know these things, that you have no regrets, that you didn't do something that you should have done in the beginning. Yeah, I think that's, that's very valuable. And I think there's this, you know, we were talking about this before we started recording that there's this, you know, we're sort of taught from a young age that police know what they're doing. They're, you know, they're the professionals. They, you know, they're going to do all the right things or as much as they can possibly do in these types of scenarios. But then what we continue to see and when talking with families, this is a consistent similarity between cases is that when you think the police, when you assume that the police are doing something, 
it, it's almost a risk to assume that because there's a there's a good chance that they're not actually doing those things mm -hmm. that they need to do or even doing the most simple things that you think are common sense that a police officer or detective would know to do and they just don't do those things for one reason or another and obviously it differs per case but or they do them wrong or they just do them do them completely wrong and mm -hmm. so you have to almost be your own advocate and push for things like you just said that you feel in your gut that need to be done um, especially in those early hours um, when someone goes missing so I think everything you guys are doing with with Jelani's foundation is is probably some of the most important work that needs to be done yeah. in in society today because this is a systemic issue that is not going away anytime soon and the more that we talk about it and the more that people know what's really going on i think the closer we get to hopefully making things better for everybody i mean that's the hope right mm -hmm. so yeah i love the idea for this playbook this is something that so many families will be able to utilize i think it's a great a great way to put you know these resources to good use so these t-shirts are available we'll have links below so that you guys can support the foundation um, there's also a GoFundMe active as well where donations can go towards monetary reward uh, mental and grief counseling to assist their family in the days going forward um, and you guys have gotten quite a bit of support on that so far but we have an um and that is appreciated as well. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the motivating things that, like I said, with the foundation that I want to do, because those people that gave to us, mm -hmm. um, it helped us uh, uh, in ways that they can't imagine um, with helping to pay for the autopsies or, you know, helping to pay for the travel, the gas, the things that we had to do. Um, so, Again, it's a, the give back, you know. I want to reciprocate yeah. back to what was given to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of people understand how much money it takes to do your own investigating and to really continue to fight on, on your case because, I mean, none of these services are, are, are cheap and private investigators cost a lot of money. I mean, to do private autopsies, things like that, none of that is is you know exactly affordable so there's there's a lot of resources that you guys have needed in order to help push Jelani's case along that without the GoFundMe um, may or may not have been possible so that's why it's so important to support support families in in their fight for justice because it's not you know it, it's a huge range of different things that that need to be done and all of it costs money unfortunately yeah. so unfortunately it does there's some things that people volunteer to do, but if they go beyond that realm of what they're volunteering costs, um, it's money incorporated with it. It's, yeah. You know, there's a cost that's associated with it. Um, and so those monies are important. Absolutely. They are. Well, we would like to make another found, uh, donation to you guys today as well. And whether you want to put that towards the GoFundMe or to the foundation is completely up to you. Um, we can talk about that after and figure out where you guys think that would be best to put. Well, thank you. You're welcome. It's, we're happy to help. We want to see justice for Jelani. There's also a petition that you guys can sign. I will have that linked below as well. It takes seconds, you guys, to take a to sign a petition, and it, it does make a big difference. Also, we are going to have information listed in the description and show notes of people that you can contact and exactly what you can say. We've kind of drawn up a little like example, Script, which you, you yeah. can change. Um, we do always advise people to be firm, but to not be aggressive because we do get the best responses when you know, you're coming from a... It's, it's a hard line because you want to be demanding to some degree, but we also don't want to anger them further because we want things to get done. Um, so we will have exactly kind of a template for what you can say. There's going to be ways to email, to call uh, multiple departments, multiple people. So all that will be listed below. And we know you guys have done amazing in the past when it comes to, you know, really going after these people. And sometimes it takes that pressure and we need to let them know that we're still here wanting answers for Jelani 
in 2023. I'm not going to let that be my concern if they get Mm -hmm. angry. You know, it's been almost two years. And the things that we, myself and my children and my family and my team have had to even take care of within these two years that they didn't do that, that things that I still had to point out to them. Mm -hmm. If, if anybody needs to be angry, it's me. So in us, in the audience that is going to be um, sending out the emails or making the calls to be frank with you, (laughs) I don't care. care I don't care if they make the police angry. I don't care if they make those people's angry that they need to be angry. All right. You heard her. Let's make them angry. We've done that before too. So, um, you know, the more that they get, I feel like the more pressure they're going to feel. And, um, it really does go a long way. We've seen success with that in other cases. Also, I wanted to, uh, point out that for those of you who are local, um, there's a second annual all white remembrance dinner on August 26th. Um, this year it's in normal, uh, Illinois at the bone student center and on the ISU campus. Okay. Yeah. Um, the tickets are $50 for adults, 25 for students. It's available on Eventbrite. We'll have that linked below as well. Um, do you guys want to talk a little bit more about what that will be like? Um, that event will be um, one that, again, we will speak on um, hopefully updating. We'll have a, more current updates at that event as well. Um, we're also pushing for um, things that we'll have coming up in the future. Um, call to actions that we'll, we will be wanting to get assistance with. Also, um, last year I said um, I didn't look at it as a celebration of a D- Jelani, mm-hmm. which is not a celebration of him, but it's an honor for him. It brings um, my family and the people that we've adopted into our family that mm-hmm. they found love for Jelani to bring us all together to show not only um, um, solidarity, yeah, the yeah. solidarity and the love that they've had for us, but to let them know that we appreciate them. And in the process of us showing our appreciation, that they are, um, they're being a part of what we're doing for Jelani. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's important for me because I know that people are always inquiring as to what can they do to help us and how we're doing and what's going on. And I haven't been very vocal lately. So um, at this event, I just want them to know that they're appreciated and that um, I still want them to feel like they're a part of this family, a part of Jelani. And this is one way by showing them. It's amazing. I love that. that. So information for that will be available as well. And how can people follow your journey if they're not local? How can they stay in touch with what you guys are doing on social media? We have um, a Justice for Jelani Day page on both uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, those pages will keep them updated. Um, I know in the future, they, my children, that my children are over the social media. My daughter is handling the social media. She will be creating something on Twitter as well um, for people to follow us as well. So look for those things. Something else I'm missing that we have on social media. We have the Jelani Day Foundation uh, Instagram page as well. Yeah. Mm. So we keep events that we have coming up soon onto that as also. Also updates about the case as well. Whenever we do feel like we need to put that out there into the media. Okay, great. We'll have all of that linked below. And, you know, even if you can't afford monetary donations, uh, at the very least, signing the petition, making those calls and following their efforts goes a long way um, because... The support is everything. Yes, because um, the police think when I get quiet and things can settle down that it all go away. But for them to know that we still have people that are backing us, that there's still an army behind us that is supporting us, that is still demanding answers from them and holding them accountable and responsible. Hopefully that'll continue to light this fire under them so they can do their job. And eventually find out what happened to Jelani so that I can leave them alone at yeah. some point. Yeah. And I think that's, that's another what reason, they want. That's another reason why it's so important that we started the foundation too, because so many people that 
say they were so inspired by my mother or by us or how we continue to fight or we're still fighting and even though we're not getting the results that we're wanting at the time, if we continue to keep doing what we're doing, you know, something is going to come out from us. That's what we all believe. Something is going to happen. I believe that too. So. You guys have never given up. You're still fighting. And it's just incredible. This episode is brought to you by ZocDoc. I actually had a medical issue a few weeks ago and lo and behold, it was time to go to the doctor. But the problem was is that I haven't been to the doctor in several years, so I don't even have a primary care physician to schedule an appointment with. So I went to the only place I know to find a good doctor and that is ZocDoc. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top rated patient reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance and are located near you and treat almost any condition you're searching for. So that's exactly what I did. I popped on my ZocDoc app, put in my zip code, put in a primary care physician, just a general practitioner is what I was looking for. And I was able to schedule an appointment for literally the next day to go and see a doctor about my medical issue. It was great because I was able to look at some of the reviews for the doctor. He had a 4.89 out of five. So I thought that was a high enough score for me to go and pay him a visit. And I got to say the process from start to finish was extremely easy when booking my appointment. The office followed up with me after I booked the appointment and made sure I had all the paperwork I needed to get done prior to my appointment. It was extremely easy, efficient, and overall the doctor's experience was an A plus for me. I was able to get my issue resolved. And that is why I highly recommend you use ZocDoc for booking your next doctor's appointment. All of us look at reviews these days when it comes to services, and now you can look at reviews for doctors. And it's not just bots putting these reviews out there, it's all reviews from actual patients. The average wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between just 24 and 48 hours, which is absolutely amazing. That's it. Sometimes you can even score same day appointments. Once you find the doc you want, you can book with them immediately with just a few app taps. No more waiting awkwardly on hold with a receptionist, which nobody likes to call doctor's offices because it's usually just takes way longer than needed. ZocDoc, you can find all sorts of different doctors for basically anything that you need. I use this and so should you. So book your next appointment with ZocDoc. Go to ZocDoc.com slash mile higher and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C.com slash mile higher. ZocDoc.com slash mile higher now that we're in the thick of summer you might be looking for wholesome convenient meals to support sunny active days factor america's number one ready to eat meal kit can help you fuel fast with flavorful and nutritious ready to eat meals delivered straight to your door you'll save time eat well and stay on track reaching your goals too busy with summer plans to cook but want to make sure you're eating well with factor skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping the prepping and cleaning up too while still getting flavorful and nutritional quality you need factors fresh never frozen meals are ready to go in just two minutes so all you have to do is heat and enjoy then go back outside and soak up the warm weather factor makes it easy to stick to your wellness goals with premium ready to eat meals featuring high quality ingredients such as broccolini leeks and asparagus Treat yourself to 34 plus weekly restaurant quality options like bruschetta shrimp risotto, green goddess chicken, which is one of my personal favorites, and grilled steakhouse filet mignon ready in just two minutes. Plus, they've got those protein plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. Factor offers delicious flavor packed options on the menu each week to fit a variety of lifestyles from keto to calorie smart vegan plus veggie and protein plus all of their meals are prepared by chefs and approved by dietitians each meal has all the ingredients you need to feel satisfied all day long while meeting your goals they even got you covered when it comes to snacks replenish your snack supply with an assortment of 45 plus add-ons including breakfast items like their delicious apple cinnamon pancakes bacon and cheddar egg bites and potato bacon and egg breakfast skillet or for an easy wellness boost try refreshing beverage options like cold pressed juices shakes and smoothies with Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. They offset 100% of their delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices, and they even use sustainably sourced seafood in their meals. This July, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered right to your door, ready in just two minutes. No shopping, no prepping, no 
mess. Head to factormeals.com slash milehar50 and use code milehar50 to get 50% off. That's code milehar50 at factormeals.com slash milehar50 to get that 50% off. So let's start by talking a little bit more about Jelani. So Jelani, Jesse, Javante Day was born June 15th, 1996 in Danville, Illinois. He was born into a large family. Your family sounds amazing. Very loving, close family. He was the second oldest or second youngest of five siblings. Can you guys tell us a little bit more about the rest of your family and the dynamic between you all? I was fortunate enough to have five healthy, beautiful children. Um, they all are unique and special in their own ways. Um, Jelani was the fourth one. Jelani was um, the busiest one. <laughs> The greediest one. <laughs> oh, Jelani, uh, Jelani just did some of everything. Uh, as Jelani growed and became him, you know, he was outspoken. Um, he was the one that, if everybody's quiet in the room, he's gonna make the he's he's gonna be loud coming there, saying something loud, disrupting. The quiet, yeah, the quietness, you know. Um, <laughs> he was gonna be the one to meddle, the one I'm screaming at the most in the house. <laughs> That's Jelani. Um, he he always wanted to rest, so I've got holes in my walls right now that I have not cut. I told him that he was gonna fix my wall, he he didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but him and Save and DeAndre were wrestling, they put holes in my wall. But that's just him. You know, the dynamics of them was and is special because they were all so close. They are all so close. And that's something that I wanted for all of them. I wanted them to be extremely close because I would always tell them that if something happened to me or if something happened to their dad, I needed for them to have each other. And through this process, I've seen that what we've instilled in them was that it came out of them because they had each other. They still do. They look out for each other. And that's the thing that, um, that really um, makes me feel good as their mom because they are looking out for Jelani. They're there. When I, when it's, when it gets tough for me and when I can't do stuff, they take over. They take over they because they want to know as bad as I do why their brother isn't here. So um, that closeness that my kids have, um, that's something that that um, as a parent I worked on and I wanted them to have, and I'm proud of them for that. You know, they I loved how they liked being together and hanging out together. They were all their own best friends. They are, you know, so um, they get on each other and correct each other, or gang up on the other one. And But Jelani would tell them he doesn't need them. He's like, he's the team of me and he could protect himself and take care of himself. And he say, mom, your kids are coming for me. Your, your kids, they, um, mom, your kids always want to be like me. I'm like, Jelani, you want to be like them. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just loved how they, um, they re relating, they, their bond and they just, they just always been close. I made sure of that. I used to make them, they would fuss and fight and I make them sit there and hold hands or hug each other. Work it out. Mm -hmm. They yeah. had to stand in front of and face each other and, Tell each other something. Tell name something good that you like about each one of your siblings. <laughs> I love that. That's they, great. They didn't like doing that kind of stuff, but sure. <laughs> it worked. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it absolutely did. It did. What about you, Savang? Um, I wouldn't say it all that worked, but um, <laughs> um, it was growing up with Jelani and my other siblings. Uh, we we just. Everybody to me is annoying. Yeah, they all say the same thing about me too. But, <laughs> um, 
we even though we, no matter what we all <clears throat> got into it about probably the most littlest of things but that's what brought us all together at the same time like regardless if it was about food or a tv show or music whatever it was we would argue debate about whatever it was and so i really enjoyed that because <clears throat> that's what helped me be able to be vocal that's what helped i mean i feel like all of us to be vocal about whatever it is any topic it is or what we strongly feel about or passionate about um and jelani he was very good at speaking passionately about whatever you felt like was you know his opinion or what he felt like was right he was um, definitely a debater yeah, so we, we definitely had some back and forths, um, holes in the wall, maybe. And I didn't have nothing to do with that. But <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but we all were very close. And um, even though sometimes, like, we didn't even want to, like, go to places with each other or whatever, but our parents would, like, make us go to different places with each other sometimes. And so uh, we would appreciate that because this has helped us, like, uh, get more of a – idea of how each one is you know to help us grow and be able to move in public or whatever it is and bond yeah well you can all learn from each other right like you all bring something different to the table and Mm -hmm. and learn and grow that way right how was um how was like going to school together and stuff um going to school together (laughs) so it was it was odd because so so danville we have a small place not that big um, everybody, is it like one school, one elementary, one middle, one high school, or is it a little bit bigger than that? A little bit bigger than that. Yeah. Got, they only have one high, well, it was a private one high, public high school. One public. Oh, okay. One yeah. public high school. So everybody knew who our parents were because they grew up or they did things in the community. Um, my dad used to sub at schools. My mom and my auntie, they would pop up anytime they want. And <laughs> no matter what it was, yeah, uh, we would get in trouble at school. And they would be the first ones there. So they would sit in the classroom or uh, they're getting to it with the teacher, principal, whoever it was. So they knew who our parents was. They knew who we were. And even with growing up, um, I wouldn't say, well, we were pretty known. Um, Like we did a lot of things with homecoming, um, homecoming course, things like that. Me and my brothers would always compete about okay, how many votes did you get for homecoming yeah. court or whatever? Um, and, of course, I would win all each time. But <laughs> <laughs> um, even with sports, we did sports, and uh, we were very competitive in that as well. Um, I just did sports just to hang out and kick it. But uh, they – and plus just to be – act like I'm better than my brothers and stuff. Yeah, too. yeah. And that's what – but that all pushed us. Like, it all pushed us to, like, want to do more and be better. and. Um, as long as I was better than them, I didn't really care. <laughs> so um, it just high school was um, everybody knew he was because they knew, OK, Jelani didn't like how people would. Um, oh, your Savage's little brother. He wanted to be known for Jelani. Right. right. Or your DeAndre's little brother. He wanted to be known for himself because people already knew who he were. And then he would come along. And so um, <laughs> he would just tag along at first for sure but then he, he started getting making his own name for himself or whatever and doing his own thing so now Jelani was his own little entity <laughs> so <laughs> um he was happy about that and of course he was the more outspoken one for sure everybody knew each other and um we had a good relationship with pretty much the whole community our family did of course for sure so do you guys have any like funny memories or stories that you can share oh, I like, a lot favorite I'm sure there's tons. Oh, a lot of them. A lot of them. I can tell you one. Um, Jelani was probably maybe, maybe he was one going on two. And like I said, Jelani likes to eat. He loves to eat. <laughs> um, and me and his dad were in the bed. And it was like in the middle of the night. And I know we had put everybody to bed and everything. And I kept hearing this noise. And I woke him up. I'm like, Dad, you hear that? He's like, Carmen, what do you hear? And I'm like, listen. And you can hear like some like little chewing or something. And I thought, <laughs> oh, get up. We got a mouse or something. He was like, <laughs> I'm not going to get up. He didn't want to get up. <laughs> and so um, I still keep hearing this noise. And I'm like, do you hear that? And it, it seemed like it was closer to us. 
And um, I was like, you don't hear that? And he wanted to go to sleep. And I kept waking him up. And I'm like, it's under the bed. He's like, ain't nothing under the bed, Carmen. <laughs> and I, we get that. I was like, look under the bed. So we look under the bed. And Jelani is under the bed. <laughs> Eating some chicken. Because <laughs> we had told him he couldn't have none before he went to bed. And he done came in our room and got under the bed and he's eating the chicken. I'm like, why? That is so funny. He went under the bed. <laughs> Jelani would do all kinds of stuff. Jelani was always doing something. Just always. never stopped. Oh, like every, I would tell them all the time. I'm like, every day, one of my kids is doing something. Mainly it was Jelani. Jelani would be, uh, I don't care what it was, whether it was at school, if he was at jo- on his job. I don't know what. Jelani just was always into something. He kept me busy, kept me busy. I go to school and um, I, because I, I would, I didn't have to work when they were younger. I was afforded the opportunity to be an at home mom. And so I used to always pop at, pop up in their classrooms and they hated it. But I had to with Jelani because he was always doing something. He was always in trouble. And then one particular day I go to the school and they, they've got him sitting outside in the hallway with this box around him. And I'm like, why is you sitting with this box around you? And I'm getting mad at the teacher. I'm like, you do not put my son in the hallway with a box around him. She's like, but he will not leave everybody alone. So I'm like, and Jelani was like, mom, I didn't do anything. I got my work done. And so, you know, you know your kid, right? Mm-hmm. I know Jelani can be worsome but I also knew that he didn't deserve to be out there alienated from everybody in this box so me and the teacher we have a conversation and she apologizes for putting this box around him I'm like because you don't do that you don't make him Mm. feel like that and he gets back in the classroom and she her name um I can't remember her name but um she tells me "Uh, you just don't know Jelani is always bothering somebody Jelani's sitting up there. He's looking so innocent. And I'm sitting in the back, so I sit in the classroom with him. And years later, Jelani is like maybe a senior in high school. And we was talking, and he said, Mom, you know when you used to always come to my class and used to get on that lady? And and he knew her name. And I was like, yeah. He said, Mom, she wasn't lying on me. I was messing with everybody. <laughs> I said, Jelani, and you had me fussing with this lady in that classroom like that. <laughs> He's like, but mom, she deserved it. She deserved it because she was she was being mean to me sometime. And I was like, yeah, my mom's getting ready to come. My mom's getting ready to come. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> and he really stayed busy throughout life. Like he was oh. just that type of person, active in everything from sports, Always. church. What was his role like in church? I know he was very involved with uh, St. Synagogue Church of that's God where Christ. they, um, from the day that they were able to go to church, um, after my six weeks and I was able to go back to church, that's where they were always. We went to church all the time, um, participated in everything at church, Easter speeches, Easter plays, um, youth programs. They had youth um, on Tuesday nights. There was youth service. You know, they participated in that. They were in the choir. Um, there was a drill team at church. I was the leader of the drill team, so all my kids were involved in the drill team. We traveled with um, the church. Um, a lot of friends. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, th- I mean. The church is like another extended family. family. Yeah, it's family, mm-hmm. basically. Sure. So, I can tell you this, that what I instilled in them from when they were little, that when they got older, when July was older, I never had to tell him to go to church. Mm-hmm. So even these the past two years before this incident happened with him. Jelani was going to church on his own. I I was not at home. He was he staying in our house in Danville, him and his older brother. And he was very active in church still. Um, he would be, and it was COVID, and they did Bible study on um, Zoom. And I would be at work. I worked a lot of overtime. And Jelani would call me. He'd be like, Mom, I don't see you on the Zoom. You're not at in Bible study, and I'm like, Jelani, I'll be on there. But Jelani was always on there. He would tell me about what was this discussion or what they were studying. I, like I said, all of them do different. You know, um, if I do tell him I want him there, they would all show up. But for them to um, 
the the things that I instilled in them that we, as the Bible says, to raise up a child when they are young and when they grow old, it will not depart from them. And it did not depart from them. And that's one thing I'm so grateful for because as I see things that Jelani did and um, even in his absence, because I know before when me and him would talk, he would always say, he something would happen. He passed his test. He called me. He's like, Oh mom, I was praying. Thank God I did this and all this. So he always kept God first. And that was something that was important for me as well with him. Um, so him being involved in the things that he was involved in and knowing that um, he was active in his church and, and wanting to be at church on his own. Mm-hmm. That said a lot for me. Yeah. Said a lot for me. Yeah, faith was very important to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was also extremely athletic. I know we've already talked about how many sports he played. Can we specifically talk about him as a swimmer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He um joined swimming um when he was in high school. I wanna say it was either his sophomore or junior year. Um his dad, he was the one that influenced him to do it. It built up his endurance for track. Um, mm, that's yeah, that's good training for track yeah. for sure. And because their dad always um, put them in stuff like in the off season of that sport to build them up, to tell them like they did. He ran cross country to make his, you know, to help him with his sprints and things like that. Because Jelani was a sprinter, he did the four by one and all that. Um, he actually his picture is on the wall at the high school for. Oh uh, wow. Yeah, when he was participating in that, he went to state and everything. So, um, he was in on the swim team, and um, I know he could swim. And then he would swim when he would go to the Y and work out. You know, so when they wanted to give us this narrative that he drowned himself, it was impossible because you knowing how to swim innately, you're not going to let yourself drown. You're going to try to save yourself. Right. So there's no way that um, him being a swimmer, that he would go to a river and drown himself. Right. And my, my dad at the time, uh, my dad, he would work out. That was his way of working out, was going to the and swim. And so even before then, like, he would take us when we were little, like, get us up, or we'll probably go to, like, um, the track. And while he's working out, he'll make us just do something, walk or run with him. And as we got older, that's when he was showing us, like, okay, we're going to the pool. We'll go to the pool, swim. And that's, I think, what, that's what we all learned how to swim. I mean, I know that's what I learned at the Y. Um, <clears throat> but also, too, even when Jelani was doing swimming, um, he, he loved going to swim practice. And he wanted to also walk, work out with my dad. To, because he couldn't do a lot of physical like lifting weights at the time too when we got older um he had to ease his way up so the best way because swimming works out your whole body um works out a lot of body parts and so um he joined he wanted to be able to <clears throat> when he was going to be in danville wanted to work out with my dad while he's there so yep he used to go in there swim with his dad and yeah. help him you know because his dad needed to exercise you know, to help keep him, to keep him up. Because like I said, his dad was fighting too because of his illness and everything. He wanted to get better. And Jelani was the main one, was one, I mean, all of them pushed their dad to be, but Jelani, like I said, Jelani was like a bill collector. Jelani would be like a gnat. So he'd be like, dad, you're not supposed to be eating this. Dad, you got to do this. Dad, you know, he was always pushing his dad to do stuff. And he would be in there working out with his dad and doing stuff with his dad. Because he was diagnosed with leukemia. Yeah, yeah. When yeah, was that, that? Was, that was that later. was later? That was later on. Yeah, but it was more so when he was dealing with his uh, heart, heart failure. Oh, okay. So, um, the left side of my rehab. dad's heart, right? And so for him to get back, he had to get at a certain weight for them to do the surgery and for them to get on that uh, on that list. The heart transplant, right? And so um, that's when he was doing more so those type of workouts, so he can be yeah. able to go in there. And what year was he diagnosed with leukemia? That was. 2020? 2020? I think it was 2020. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he, Jelani was the closest match for him for stem cells, correct? Well, Jelani was the one that was going to give him the stem cells. Mm-hmm. All three of yeah. them matched him. Yeah, we were all matches. They all oh, matched okay. him, but Jelani was the one that was going to give him 
the stem cells. Wow. And to give that, to do that stem cell transplant, um, the one person that was going to do it had to be the one to, you had to do a certain, a couple of different procedures with them. Yeah. Before you could do that. And Jelani already had started doing those procedures. Oh, he did. He already started doing those procedures and he just didn't do probably just one more that he was supposed to do mm-hmm. for it to happen later on um, for the stem cell transplant and everything else happened. Yeah. So he never had that chance. Never had the chance. And so that's one of the reasons, again, why he wouldn't do anything to himself. He knew what the importance was of this for his dad, too. Yeah. That's a good point. And he was going through the process to get this stuff done for mm-hmm. his dad. He knew how vital yeah, he, he was knew. to he his knew, father. He knew. Mm-hmm. He knew. Uh, he was traveling back and forth, you know, taking his dad to his doctor's appointments in Chicago and all of that. He knew what the risks were. He knew what, what, what was needed. Yeah. You know, he knew what was needed. So he wouldn't have dared into his life knowing that he was going to really help save his dad to get better. His dad was very important to him. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are many, many reasons he wouldn't have taken his life, but that, many, many that's reasons. a big reason. Yeah. Um, okay. So after he graduated high school, he attended Alabama A&M University mm-hmm. in Huntsville and studied speech pathology. What made him go into speech pathology? Well, um, growing up in elementary school, Jelani had a friend. His name was Paul. His name is Paul. And Paul um, had some limitations, and one of them was his speech. Hmm. Um, him and Jelani became friends. And um, Jelani used to take up for Paul because Paul couldn't articulate hmm. very well. And Jelani used to take up for Paul. And so when Jelani went to college and he chose speech pathology, he had told me that um, he chose that because he wanted to help people like Paul to be able to talk. And um, how he would see Paul sometimes, and him and Paul would still, you know, talk. Paul still to this day, matter of fact, he just texted me yesterday. Um, he checks on me and uh, talks about Jelani, and um, he misses Jelani. He calls Jelani his best friend. Um, that's just how Jelani was, you know. That was one of his main reasons for choosing speech pathology. He was interested in the um, the science and the art of helping people to talk because he would always tell Seve and DeAndre they had a lisp when they were growing up and they used to Nobody go Nobody had a lisp. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody had a lisp. DeAndre they, had an accent. I couldn't say my R's. <laughs> I couldn't um, either as a kid. So, so Jelani used to always tell them that he was going to help them to speak better. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no doubt he would have gone far in life. He wanted to be a doctor. He was brilliant. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely, Kendall. I have to say I do have some brilliant children, and he was do. one of them. He is one of them. Um, Jelani was definitely an achiever. He set a goal, and he he accomplished it. Graduated top of his class. He did. He Extremely did. That was impressive. And that was big for him. He wanted to make sure they knew it, too. He wanted to make sure his siblings knew it. Like, he would tell them that when y'all get here, and we were talking about his graduation, when y'all get here, I'm going to be, he told us that he was going to be doing something in the beginning, and he was going to be doing the prayer and all this. He was speaking. Yeah, he was going to be speaking. Ah. So. Yeah, there's a a video clip of him uh, doing the prayer at his graduation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you guys go to grad school too, or was he the only one? I'm the only one who didn't go to grad school. Oh, really? Everybody else. <laughs> Everybody did. else went to grad school. <laughs> <laughs> I was what, grad school. What I tell y'all about Save? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work. I don't know if I could ever go to grad school. So um, what, when everything happened with Jelani, Jelani, Zaina, and DeAndre and Dakar were all in grad school when this all happened with Jelani. Um, Zaina and DeAndre, by the grace of God, they continued. While we were looking for Jelani, they were still wow. doing their classes and everything um, because that was something that helped them to deal with this. They would, they needed a distraction at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, DeAndre was able to finish, and DeAndre graduated last year. Mm-hmm. He graduated with his um, master's last year. Zaina will be graduating this year with hers. Oh, that's awesome. And Dakara will be graduating next year with hers. 
Congratulations to you. It's and amazing. Jelani would have been graduating this year with his. Wow. wow. Save it. Come on. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> it's all right. I don't. I don't have a grad degree either. Yeah, so neither of us. Sports are my thing. So. They, they need to the school them more than me. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he also did a lot of. He was just involved in a lot of programs throughout school. He was in a fraternity. Mm-hmm. He um, worked at a family adv- advocacy organization as well. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about you know what it meant to him to help others and not only in his future career but all the ways that he wanted to impact his community. He was big on um, community service. One of the things, like I told, I don't know, um, when we talked earlier, how I told you um, me and his dad, well, his dad mainly, Seve had started them off early. And when I say Seve, I'm talking about my husband, their dad. Um, they when One of the things that when he did was um, he told me, you know, Carmen, we they got he used to always put them in sports. Now, they all tried a whole bunch of different sports: soccer, football, tennis, um, swimming. Every sport that you can think of, except lacrosse, because we didn't have it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. They've all. Then that's no lie. They, he he made sure that they tried. If they didn't do anything, everybody tried it at least once to see if they liked it. That's cool. Um, because he he would say we don't have money to put them through college, so they got to get a degree. Uh, they got to get a, a a scholarship with sports, and so we had to make sure their academics. I was the one that was focused on the academics. He was focused on the sports, and then you know we collaborated with both of that, and so that's how they got through with the college. And one of the things when you when you're um, applying for scholarships, community service is a big thing on right. there. So. When they were in high school, I used to make sure that they were involved in AMBUCS, um, student council, stuff like that, because mm-hmm. they had to have those things on their on their scholarship resume. So when Jelani got in college, he knew the importance of that. And plus, he liked to help people because those different organizations helped him gain more um, monies. For, you can get monies for participating in stuff like that for scholarship. And one of the biggest things I was always trying to teach them was to not um, build up a lot of student debt mm-hmm. while in college, student loan debt. And he was working toward that goal is to not have student loan debt by participating in these programs. And he liked it. He, um, when he was at Alabama a and I know he was working with some kids at um, some school districts. That's how he was gaining credits through for his program with that. Um, he was in Collegiate 100. He was in a hundred black men. Um, he was, he, you know, he was online with his fraternity. He joined house arrest, which was a, a he liked to dance. So he was on a that house arrest team at Alabama A and M. It's like a dance crew. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, How do you have time for all this? I know. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like man. exhausted listening to it. I'm that just was a busy Jelani schedule. was busy. It's all like the Energizer the Bunny. It's like when keep going. growing up, our our dad put us in a lot of different stuff, like whether mm-hmm. it was sports related or it was community service involved. Like my dad, he used to, he worked a lot of schools. He had a lot of different jobs and worked for a lot of different community action programs too. So um, he was doing things like the Boys and Girls Club and um, a lot of different things, but he'll make us go to these things. Like uh, I'll never forget, like we had to get up one time and him and my mom made us go to like this. Uh, I see now why. Cause that's the type of work I do now as I'm older, but uh, they'll make us go to like the soup kitchens on Christmas Mm -hmm. and we'll, you know, help pass out the food to the less fortunate and um, like do stuff like that. Yeah. So um, at first, you know, really me, younger me, of course, like, why am I here? Why am I doing it? Right. Right. But now I see the bigger picture now that I'm older and everything. Mm hmm. Well, I guess it's really when it's instilled, yeah, instilled into you, yeah. it doesn't seem, it just seems like a part of your normal routine mm-hmm. as you get older. So it makes sense that mm-hmm. he would continue that throughout his life and yeah. into college. And, right. Yeah. Like, you know, you, we never understand why our parents make us do stuff when we sure. right, yeah. right? Of course. Um, until you're older. Until and, you're older and you realize there's a lesson in everything mm-hmm. and there's a reason behind it. Mm-hmm. And it builds character and it, it, it builds you and it helps you to become the person that you are. Um, and that's another thing. My children, um, they knew we instilled in them to be respectful, to be of their elders. I don't care who you were. I would always tell them, 
you never get smart with an adult. You never talk back to an adult. You, even if they're wrong, you say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Shut your mouth, whatever. You let me and your dad know, and we will handle that for you. And those were things that uh, they all, you know, they did. I, Jelani was the one that sometime I would have to get him, but um, Jelani would hurry up and he called me. Like Jelani, like I said, there's so many stories I have about Jelani. He would do things and he almost got kicked out of school one time and me and his dad are in the office and his dad's like, kick him out. Jelani looked at his dad like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Jelani so told me, mom, I'm so glad you was there because daddy was going to let them kick me out of school. <laughs> He's like encouraging it. That's hilarious. But Jelani was, Jelani was always doing something. He just kept us busy. He yeah. kept, and so his dad always believed he, and he would tell me, Carmen, if we keep them busy, they don't have they don't have time to get in trouble. They don't That's have time true. to do nothing else. So and Jelani carried this on as he grew up and then when he was in college, he stayed busy all the time. He didn't have time for I mean, he made time for what he wanted to make time sure. for. They're still your you know? friends. Yeah. And... He, I mean, he had a balance of his life. I mean, he was active in what he was active in, but then he also had his social life because he loved to socialize. And he I guess sleep for him, you know. He get in his hour so yeah. he can still get out there and still do his thing. That's just how Jelani was. That's just him. He was just busy, active, loved to be having fun. He loved to have fun. And, and as I reflect back on his 25 years of life, I was like, Jelani traveled. Did a lot. He did. He traveled. He he was the brokest, the richest broke kid I know out of all my five of my kids because he was in Mexico. He was, went to Jamaica. He he was always doing stuff. Wow. He had his passport before any of us. He was always doing stuff. Um, and when all of this happened to him and I sat back, and I'm like, God, I thank you because my son lived his life. Yeah. You know, he lived. He did a lot. In he did. Years. He did a lot. And when I, as I continue to think about him and I think about him all the time, in his 25 years of life, Jelani did a lot. That's why I feel like he's so impactful now because mm -hmm. he's done a lot. The people that I speak to that speak to me about him, that knew him, they tell me all these things about how he stood up for different people. This girl wrote me and she told me how she was in a class with him at Alabama A&M and how a professor was talking down to her. And um, she said, out of all the people in the class, Jelani spoke up for her wow. and she said she'll never forget him. And that really just touched my heart to know that my son, he was like one, he, he didn't like to see people mistreated. He was always advocating or wanting to advocate for somebody. And that was, uh, like I said, with him choosing speech pathology, yeah. it was an advocacy thing for him. Yeah. He impacted so many and would have, continued to do mm -hmm. so. When he graduated college, he was accepted into Illinois State's University graduate speech pathology program, which is not easy. Um, no. I'm sure it wasn't that shocking to you as you knew that he was destined for great things, no. but you must have been so proud. That's Absolutely, I was. Um, but before he was accepted at ISU, Jelani was in Michigan um, and then COVID hit. And then he didn't get to go to his grad program that oh, year because really? that's where he was going to school at initially. Um, and um, being in grad school was important to him. So at first, like I said, that program is a very difficult program to get into. Yeah. And he had applied at so many schools and he kept getting put on waiting lists. And I was like, okay, Jelani, come back home and you can be closer to me and apply for schools in this area. I wanted him to apply for schools because I was in Southern Illinois mm. down that way. Mm -hmm. So like I told him, you've already been so far away from me so, so for so long and I want you to be close. And he was like, mom, I don't want to go to school down there. But I kept on, I was like, well, maybe God will open a door. So I talked him into applying for ISU and SIU and all those schools. And then that one day he got the acceptance letter for ISU and he sent me the copy of, he texted me the picture of the letter and um, he was he was excited. He was happy because he wanted to be back in school so bad. He did not want to be sitting around, 
He did not just be wanting to be just work some job. He wanted to be in school because he's he was like he had this plan. Him and his group of friends that he went to college with, everybody was focused on what they were going to do with their career, and he felt like he wasn't doing it at the time. So when he got accepted into school, that was like big and major for him, and he was all excited. And initially, like I said, it was COVID, so they were doing everything online. That summer, he the summer before he went to school in August of twenty one, he did. Everything online. Mm. And then um, he applied for that apartment when he knew that school was opening up. And um, I was like, Jelani, can you afford that? He was like, no, but me and daddy can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and his brothers and sisters would be like, Jelani, they ain't going to let you do that. Jelani was like, he told me later on. I tell them all the time, Jelani has the gift of talking you and daddy into anything. I was like, Jelani, no, you do not. But he did. <laughs> they just did anything anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. It, it yeah. did. It worked. He tells Zayna, he tells he tells Zayna all the time, Zayna, you need to learn how to work mama and daddy. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he um got that. We got him that apartment and um This was fall twenty twenty one. 2021 mm -hmm. um, he actually got the apartment like the beginning of july a month before okay. school started and um he didn't have any furniture or anything but he had went down there and got the keys and so he um called me and showed me the apartment and everything because i didn't actually get to see the apartment till like the mid the end of july um i had went down there and, and this is in bloomington and this is in bloomington okay. yep um then school started in august and um, I told him he was going to, I was going to give him, we we're going to move my furniture down there. I was going to get new furniture. I'll give him my furniture. So um, he didn't have any furniture or anything. He didn't have a bed. We hadn't got him a bed. He had bought him a blow up mattress. <laughs> and um, he was waiting for us to take the furniture to him. And of course, I never got to do that because he went missing. And you and Jelani were super, super close. Um, I know you told me yesterday you, he called him your bill collector. <laughs> so then he I, stayed in touch constantly. Because he would nag me all the time. I mean, Jelani would, if I didn't answer my phone, it's nothing for Jelani to call me. And I would hit, I wouldn't, if I, if I hit ignore, <laughs> he going to call me back to back to back to back <laughs> to back to back. He had called me like 10 times and then I answered the phone and be like, what Jelani? What you doing, mom? Jelani, I'm busy. <laughs> okay. Well, what are you doing? He would make me tell him what I was doing. Or he said, okay, I, I didn't want nothing. Call me back, mom. I'm like, okay. But he did that all the time. That was his routine. Mm -hmm. Then if I would text him, I'd be like, boy, quit calling me. He call, he text me back. Like, okay, I'm sorry. He didn't care. He called me right back anyway. He, he just did that all the time. So, um, and he was, he's the only one of my kids that does that to me. He's the only one. He loved you. He did. He did. Um, and I hate to say he did because he does. He loves me. He does. He does. So in those, you know, first days at ISU, everything was normal. He's going to classes. He's calling you pr pretty much daily or someone in the family every day. Actually, him and Save had just went to Texas, Zaina was going to, um, she had enrolled in grad school at Texas Southern. Okay. So me and her were supposed to be um, taking, uh, we were going to fly down there for her school. And so the thing with my kids is that every time somebody went to school, we all went to drop them off, okay? Because number one, everybody wants to be, you know, there with them. And number two, they all nosy and they got to see yeah. everything and see what's going on. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, even going to grad school, it was no different, you know, and this is their baby sister. And so the car couldn't go. She had to work. Deandre had to work, but Savi and Jelani, they were going to make sure that they were going to be there. Oh. And, um, then Zaina messed up with her housing and Jelani called me. He's like, mama, you let Zaina trick you. And cause I was going to take her down there, but she didn't have her housing together. And, and so um, we ended up not going, but Save and Jelani went to Texas anyway, and they were down there that weekend before all of this stuff happened with Jelani because me and Zayna were supposed to be down there. Um, and when Jelani came back that Sunday, he 
let me know he was back. Um, he told me that he had to get ready. He had some assignments he was doing. He told me he had clinicals that week. Um, he was going to be getting his stuff together. and He was going to go see his dad. He hadn't because he got back on that Sunday. That Monday, like I said, I was at work. Him and I were on the phone from that morning because I go. I was at work at seven o'clock that morning. I, I will say about seven fifteen, between seven fifteen and seven forty-five. Jeline was on the phone with me, and me and him was on the phone throughout that whole day until a little bit before nine that night. Was that was the last time I spoke to him that day on that Monday? We had talked numerous times that day. I was telling, you know, we were getting ready because the payment, we were going to Destin for Thanksgiving and he was supposed to be, I was making all of them be responsible and pay their part. I was, I wasn't going to pay their part for them. And July was supposed to have been doing that that day. We talked about our birthdays that day. We talked about a TV show he was watching because he didn't want to get off the phone with me that day. <laughs> it was just a whole bunch of stuff we were doing that day that I talked to him like multiple times that day between that morning and that evening mm -hmm. and nothing seemed odd or out of the ordinary there for was you. nothing out or out the way nothing that wasn't ordinary even that last phone call that we had that night i got off of work that night a little bit late and i was at home and i was tired i was gonna get in the shower and he called me and he's he wanted the um password to the cable and I was like, boy, you're going to start getting your own cable bill. Mom, what's the password? I gave him the password. And he told me that he was going to watch TV and he was going to finish up some of his homework. And he said, okay, Mom, before he, we got off the phone, he's like, okay, Mom, I just wanted to hear your voice. I'll talk to you in the morning. And that was the last time I talked to him. Wow. That's really special that he said that to you, though. I just wanted to hear your voice. Yeah, the, he, he always saw me and said that he would call me in the morning. <laughs> Okay, mom, I'm gonna let you go. I just wanted to hear your voice. No. He always said that to me. That wasn't nothing different. That that's something he would always say to me. He just wanted to hear my voice. If he was having an issue with somebody, or there was, you know, a friend maybe he was fighting with, would he ever tell either of you about stuff going on with his friends or anything like that? He would. Absolutely. Yeah, he would. For sure. Um, he would tell me stuff. But he would talk to my oldest daughter. He would tell her sometimes way more than what he would tell me. Sure. Um, he would talk to them. But I know I know him and Dakara, he always confided stuff with Dakara. Um Yeah, he would tell he would have told us. Yeah, it seems like it. That there'd be no reason for him to keep something hidden from you guys or anything like that. No. What about you, Save? What was the last time you talked with Jelani? That was the, the flight on my way back to Illinois. His flight was leaving before mine. Um, but I was still out there in uh, Houston. He was in Houston. And he was with his friends. I was with mine. Uh, I knew my sister didn't have her stuff together, but I was still going to go and enjoy myself. But, uh, yeah, me and Jelani was supposed to uh, link and... Um, go to a part to a brunch and a party together at the same time but um he he didn't have he didn't have a car he was ubering around but he was with his friends too and so i was telling him to come to this one spot that me and my friends were going to be at um by the time that happened i was already out at a whole different party with a lot of other stuff going on but um but yeah, um, the day the day he was leaving for his flight is when he called me. I told him I was still going to be out here for a few more hours. Might stay another day. And that was the last time I spoke to Jelani that, um, that week. Wow. Wow. So just, I mean, hearing both of you talk about the last time you, you talked with him, I mean, just the utter shock of, of what happens on, on Tuesday must have not even seemed real at first like just, Never saw i mean there's just it's so far beyond anything you could possibly imagine because yeah, i remember being at work I had, because basically every christmas but well, christmas now that we're older was always different um me and my siblings would all 
say, okay, we're going to get each other gifts this year. Or we wasn't going to get each other gifts. I was focused on getting my mom and dad and grandma gifts, stuff like that. And this was the year we were going to get each other gifts. So I'm like, okay. I had started, I had picked up another job. And I was working at night. And um, I remember my older sister calling me. And she was telling me to, um, do I have access to, do I know any passwords to the Verizon account? Because um, my dad, my older brother, and Jelani were all in the same account. And so um, I'm, I was like, yeah, I could get into it, but I'm like, what's going on? Like, have you talked to Jelani at all? I'm like, no, I haven't talked to him today. Um, so she's like, well, she was telling me, like, yeah, mom was panicking. Nobody heard from him. Just check on the account and see, like, when the last time he made a phone call or, or, or who he last was talking to or whatever. So I was able to get on the account and... That's when I seen like different numbers. Me and my sister was I was I was writing a number down, giving it to my sister. And that's when we seen like one of the last numbers that he called on that day was uh Cara, uh Baster Boister. Um and we had got that information from that account and definitely hit me different and her different as well because it was no no calls, no activity at all on that call log or it's text messaging. Um, the text messages was something different because if you got an iPhone, instant message doesn't pop up on there, mm. on there like right, that. Yeah. Unless it's like an Android text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll pop up on there. So I was still trying to be a little hopeful about it. But it made me nervous because knowing Jelani, he might go out all day, be out all day, and his phone will die or whatever the case may be. But he would charge his phone up or somebody would know something about what he was going to do or what he was doing um but to for it to go the whole entire night because i was working a night shift i was going the whole entire night and then the entire next morning and um i just be, remember being on the phone with my sister and i'm well contacting like any type of any one of his friends he may know and um and trying to stay calm because, like, that's not like Jelani at all. That's mm-hmm. not nothing normal that he would do. And he also didn't show up for class on Tuesday the 24th. And that's not something that he would normally do either. Well, we didn't know. We didn't know at the time that he didn't show up sure. on class on right, Tuesday. Because right. it wasn't until Wednesday mm-hmm. that um, yeah. um, we got the phone call that the police showed up at my house in Danville. Um, so, like I said, I talked to him so much on Monday that I thought I talked to him on Tuesday, that when DeAndre called me that Wednesday night, and he said, Mama, have you talked to Jelani? I'm like, I just talked to Jelani yesterday. Mm-hmm. And he said, um, the police said that Jelani is missing. And I said, missing from where? And I said, wait a minute, I'll call you back. And I called Jelani, and it went to the voicemail because Jelani keeps his phone on Do Not Disturb a lot. And that's what I used to fuss at him about all the time. But um, Jelani would tell me, um, Mom, I see it when you call me and I'll call you back. Because he did. He, If I called him and the phone was on Do Not Disturb, um, he would call me back. Or if I text him and I'd be like, you need to call me right now, he would call me right back. He, he didn't even, it wasn't like I had to wait 10, 20 right. minutes for him to call me back. He would do it right there and then. So that night when I called him and it went to the voicemail, that wasn't. What alarmed me, what alarmed me was when I never got a phone call back from him. And then when the time kept going and I still hadn't heard from him, that's when I started getting worried because that wasn't like him. Mm -mm. Um, That wasn't like him at all. And um, so I just started um, calling me and DeAndre's on the phone. And um, DeAndre said, Mom, well, I'm going to drive down. And DeAndre was going to leave Danville and go to Bloomington. I said, okay, DeAndre, go to his house. And I said, I'm going to call the police. And so DeAndre's driving there. I'm calling the police. And at the time, their dad is not feeling good. And one of them had called him. And I think by the time I talked to him, I'm like, Dave, where you at? He was on his way to Bloomington, too. And I'm like, no, you don't need to go because he— he had just got out of the he hospital. He wasn't supposed to be driving at the time. He wasn't even supposed to be mm. driving. Mm-hmm. 
But he was like, Carmen, I got to go find Jelani. You know, because it wasn't like him. He's calling Jelani. He's texting Jelani. Right. All of us are calling him. Jelani doesn't ignore us like that. So you guys all collectively were like, something's wrong here. Everybody. By this time when we're not hearing from him, all of us, but... You know, we don't, I don't want to say it to them. They don't want to say it to me because the first thing I don't want to do is be like. We don't want nobody to panic. Yeah, yeah. you don't want to jump to. Jump and jump to the worst conclusion right. that something is wrong. But we were all concerned because this is not like Jelani at all. This has never happened before. Never. Never. If he, if I, if, if any one of them, if I didn't talk to them for a day or two, me, they always talk about me anyway, because I, I tell Seve this all the time. If I don't talk to him in one day and I call him, I'm like, okay, so your mom hasn't heard from you in a month of Sundays. And he'd be like, mama, you just talked to me yesterday. I'm like, well, it feels like a month of Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I did this with Jelani all the time. Mm-hmm. And Jelani would be like, mama, you exaggerating. I just called you this morning. I'm like, Jelani, did you call me this morning? Which I already know that he did, but it's because of how frequent that they do call me. Right. And how frequent that they do keep in touch with me. Mm-hmm. Because I would tell them all the time, now that they're grown, I at least need to hear from every last one of you at least once a day. Yeah, I would tell them that all the time. And so they did it. This is the one right here that I always have to get on. But the rest of them, I don't. Mm-hmm. And Jelani was one that I didn't have to get on about that. So when I'm not hearing from him, because Jelani, when I tell Jelani to do, call me ASAP, Jelani calls me. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't hearing from him, and then his phone wasn't on. And even if he wasn't going to talk to my mom, like he would at least like we'll text him and be like, "Why are you not answering my phone, y'all?" Like yeah. she made you mad or something. He would text back and say, "Uh, yeah." Somebody. He'd tell mm-hmm. somebody. Yep. Right. He, he What's would, up? That's yeah. why I said if it wasn't me that he didn't talk to, I knew that he talked to one of them because if I'm on the phone with one of them, I'd be like, "Okay, you talked to Zayna today. You talked to Jelani. One of them can tell me that they spoke to one of them." So. I never worried because they always kept in contact with each other. Right. Or if I put in a group text, tell your brother to call me, they all jumping on that one person and they're like, okay, you know, mama wants you to call her. So, but this particular time we wasn't getting no response. Right. I wanted to jump back to what you were saying, say about yeah. checking the Verizon account and we started pulling the numbers off there. One of the, or the last number, right. Was Kara's number. Right. And so for those that don't know who Kara is, Kara, Kara is the Boaster. director of clinical education at ISU. Mm-hmm. So somebody he was actually planning on meeting on Tuesday. So the night before they had been communicating about some of his coursework and they were they agreed to meet the next day. So Monday night, Jelani had been texting her. The twenty third. The twenty third. They were texting each other back and forth. Um when I spoke to her on that Thursday morning, she said to me that her and Jelani had been texting back and forth. He was supposed to have been taking care of something for her. Excuse me. At the time, I never asked her what that taking care of something meant. Um, and that was supposed to be in por- person on the 24th. Yeah, they were supposed to. He was supposed to meet with her. And he didn't show up. And he didn't show up. Very unlike him. He didn't show up um, that day. And. Um, and he didn't show up to class at one o'clock on that Wednesday. And she was going to be at that class too. Right. Um, but if you, but when, in hindsight, when you look at everything, it was on that Tuesday when he was on campus, he was on campus on the 24th, bright and early in the morning. Mm. Um, Cause there's not, video, right? There's video of yeah, him on to campus. To confirm that he was actually there. He was on the video and he's also, to co- his confirmation that he was there, you have to swipe your card to get in and out of the computer labs mm-hmm, and to mm-hmm. use the computer. He did that on that day. So those things are time stamped of when he was there. Now, um, what I don't know and what I haven't been able to ask or what I failed to ask before was what time was he supposed to meet her that morning? Because I don't know what those times were. Um, and she was the one who initially put out a, want to do like a, a wellness check. That's Through the, the university police. Yeah, she was first police. to contact police. Right, and that's him. how the police ended up going to like their emergency contact address that was on file and ended up going all the way to Danville. Because oh, Jelani, wow. so Jelani never 
put his address, his Bloomington address, yeah, we on his other uh, address. We'd be on his school we'd stuff. Same home address for almost everything. Mm. And that's that that right there was our saving grace because had they had his address in Bloomington been on there, they would have went to a door and knocked on the door. And, and who nobody, knows if they would have done anything after that? Right. But. And who knows if they would have contacted me as soon as they contacted me? Or you know, DeAndre wouldn't have been able to tell me anything. But because Jelani had my home address in Danville listed on there. That's where the police came oh. to see if he was there because right. he had been reported missing. Um, according to Kara, when I spoke to her, she told me that her and Jelani had a meeting on that Tuesday that he failed to show up for. And she had called him and um, she didn't get an answer. So she was going to wait till Wednesday when he didn't show up for class on Wednesday after class. She filed, um, she went to the director of the um, the clinic and let her know that she was concerned that he had been absent from class. And that's when they were supposed to have um, contact the CARES, which is a group on campus that teachers, if there's a concern that you have with a student, that you contact this group. And they found a report with them. Um, she said by five o'clock they hadn't heard anything. Um, so she went back to the clinical director and they made a phone call to ask them like, okay, so have you guys checked on him? Do you know anything? And they told her that they had uh, 24 hours to respond to the request. Um, so she said that she didn't want to wait 24 hours. And so therefore she contacted the police mm. and that's how the police came to my house. Now, um, again, I've always been grateful and thankful that she moved the way that she moved because had she had not, I wouldn't have been a, I wouldn't have known anything in the time frame that I knew anything. Right. You understand? But um, there's always been those questions too, because, you know, we've all, I don't know about anybody else, but all five of my kids, like I said, they've all graduated from college, uh, undergrad and, then they went on to um, grad school. But I know every last one of my kids because I've talked to them. Even when they were in school, they used to skip class. And I've never had a teacher or a professor or um, anybody file a missing persons report because on them because class. they missed class right. for one day. Um, for what I've learned and what I've been told when I've asked about um, Kara is that she... Um, She's just a concerned person, a uh, teacher, in that she um, she communicates with the students. And um, so when Jelani went missing, for some of them, that what that didn't alarm them that she responded or reacted the way that she did. Uh, and then there's people that I've spoken to that say that they don't know that being in their position as a teacher or a professor, they've had students that's missed class as well, and it wouldn't have alarmed them within that first day to call the police. Right. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's almost like she had a like a gut feeling or something that something was mm -hmm. wrong or mm -hmm. something. But again, like I said, if it had not been for whatever reason that she took that step, I wouldn't have been made aware that my son was missing. Have, have you, you stayed in contact with her? I have not. Um, I have not. Um, a lot of different things started coming out about her. And a lot of different things came out. A lot of different things. Her husband said. also. A lot really? of a lot of different things transpired. Hmm. Um, things that in the beginning, like I said, my focus was on Jelani, where, you know, my sister, my brother, my kids. Um, they were all paying attention to everybody that was around me that was communicating with me. You know, um, when you going through this, I had tunnel vision. My tunnel vision was to find Jelani. I wasn't, if there was red flags and stuff that was popping up in that moment, I had no time to look at the red flags. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Cause there was too many other things that I right. was looking at and paying attention to. Um, Kara, um, her, when I first spoke with her on that Thursday morning, because I was made, I was made aware 
that she was the one that found the report from another student that was in the class with Jelani. Um, and when I spoke with her, I was just initially grateful at first because I was like, okay, I'm, I don't know where Jelani is. I'm telling her and she's giving me this information. And I said, well, I know the la- I know that he was at Starbucks. Can you, because I already contacted the campus police. They had put me on hold. They had told me that somebody was going to get back with me. I'm way in Southern Illinois uh, by St. Louis. So I'm like three hours away from Bloomington. I can't get to the Starbucks in the amount of time because I needed stuff to happen just like this quickly. And so she's there and I'm like, oh, can you go? And can you see if they seen Jelani, if you know, if they remember him being there? Because I don't know which Starbucks it was, but I'm giving her the code that the the bank gave me and I'm telling her the information that I have. And she's telling me, just okay. Just checking everywhere. Just, I'm, yeah. I'm just needing to check because I, I haven't like, heard from my child. Right. And so she ends up calling me back and she tells me that she went to the Starbucks and she said, well, the police have the video. At the time, I remember saying okay and getting off the phone and I was talking to, I think I told my brother and he said, well, how did she know that the police have the video? I said, I don't know. That's what she just told me. And she's going to call her friend that's a police officer and they're going to talk. They're going to um, get a detective to talk to me. And Gary says, um, but Carmen, you hadn't told nobody that he went there. It's like, oh, you're right. I didn't. So I don't know how the how police they know. Yeah. I, how they would have known, but when me and her spoke, that's the first thing she told me. She said she went there, but the police already had the video of Jelani. And keep in mind, I I had only filed the missing persons report like at ten after ten o'clock that night before, which mm-hmm. was on that Wednesday night, and it was that Thursday morning that she texted me and identified to me who she was, and that she had been communicating with Jelani. And then me and her spoke on the phone and I told her that I, cause it was after eight o'clock cause the credit union didn't open until eight. And I had to call them to see if there had been any activity on Jelani's card. And they told me that the last activity was the day before, which was the 24th at the Starbucks. And it was at six something in the morning. Well, what I learned to find out was that Jelani ordered something online at Starbucks cause uh, he didn't get to the oh. campus Right. Until seven something that morning. So he did like a so pickup order. So he placed order. his order mm. early and then he picked it up mm. at seven something that morning. Cause you see him in Starbucks on the video, picking up his order and waiting for them to make it. But the card was used at six something in the morning and come to find out he did that online, you know? Um, so when I spoke to her, and she told me about the video and then she told me, asked me who I had spoken to at the police department. And I gave her the officer's name and she called the police department and um, she spoke to someone there. And she told me that they told her that I would have to wait to speak to that detective or that police officer that took that report when he came back. Cause he didn't work until that afternoon or that evening. And she told them at the time, we don't have that time to wait because this young man is missing. And she said, well, Carmen, don't worry, because I have a friend and he I'm going to call him and he can get a detective assigned to you. And I'm like, OK, whatever you can do to help me. And I told her, I said, I'm on my way to Bloomington and I will be glad to meet with you. And whatever you find out, she said, I'll let you know whatever I find out when you get here. And I'm like, OK. And. um, I got the champagne. And. um. Me and Carlos, we left Champagne and went to Bloomington and we went to her office. We got there. I was going to go to the Starbucks because we were at the student center. But then I phoned her and I was asking her where the Starbucks was. And she asked me, was I there? And I told her, yes. And she let me know where she was located at. So we went to the building where she was located. We went to her office. And when we got to her office, um, I sat in her office and she was explaining to me how she had gotten the IT person at in their department had went through and saw. So she would show me on the computer the times where Jelani was at and what he had been doing. 
and that he had put some notes in that morning for his appointment, for his clinicals, for his patient. And she's like, well, he wasn't on there very long because he only stayed on there. It was a short amount of time that he stayed on the computer. And I said, well, that's not, I thought, because Jelani knew how to type really fast and Jelani, mm. Jelani would get his work done. Um, Did he have a personal computer? He ha- Yeah, he had a personal computer. But on okay. that particular day, he went to the campus. <laughs> to use the computer to, lab or whatever. He I, All I know, he used the computer while he was there. He got on two different computers, matter of fact, that morning while he was there. Um, she was able to show me that. She then took her phone and she put it up and she said, because we were texting and she flashed it in front of me like that. And what I didn't do, I didn't look at her phone. I didn't look at the messages. Um, I didn't take a screenshot of them. So you don't know the contents of the I didn't messages. know the content of the, at that time when okay. I was sitting there with her, I didn't know the content of the messages. I didn't know anything. Um, I just was taking her word because, again, what reason would I have to ever think anything about her because she was being so helpful to me. She was just being like as concerned as I was. And all I wanted to do was to find out where Jelani was. I wanted to talk to him. Um, so never in my thought process at the time was I thinking anything ill up toward her. Um, it wasn't until I had to go back and sit down and then start processing Mm -hmm. things that I had encountered and was doing. Um, like I said, um, it was that Thursday night we drove back to Champaign. It wasn't even that Thursday. It was that Thursday afternoon because I'd been down in Bloomington from that morning to the afternoon. And by four something that afternoon, I was in Champaign and I was getting ready to go. All my kids were at Save's apartment. And the um, Paul Jones called me on the phone and he asked me, are you familiar with Peru? Peru? And I told him no. Is he the detective? He was the detective from okay. Bloomington. He introduced himself to me at one o'clock that afternoon that he was the detective that was going to be assigned to Jelani's case. And he was asking me anything about Jelani and think what, like is like, would he do anything? Yeah. Would he do anything like this? Um, was he, would he harm himself? So me and him had spoken at one something that afternoon. And when I got back to Champaign at four 30, he called me and, um, he said to me, um, do you, have you ever heard of Peru? No, I told him that I hadn't. He asked me, did, um, I know anybody there. Did Jelani know anybody there? I told him that we didn't. He asked me, "Um, are you sure he wouldn't have went? I was like, where is Peru? Yeah. Because you've never heard of it before. I had never. I thought Peru was an island somewhere. Right. And I'm thinking to myself when he asked me, I'm like, Jelani done got on a plane. Where is Peru at? Yeah. And then he tells me it's somewhere up by Chicago. It's outside of Rockford or something, he tells me. And I'm like, oh, no. I said, but I can, I'm can. i going my way to my boys. I said, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with his fraternity. There's there some frat brothers there. He's like, um, well, won't you get to your sons and you ask them and you give me a call back. I call, I get over there and I, we get in Save's house and I, I ask them, I'm like, do y'all know anybody in Peru? And they were like, mom, where's Peru at? Hmm. I was like, I don't know. So, they're, we're all on the phones looking up Peru. Yeah, Google. Mm-hmm. We're yeah. Googling Peru and everything. And then DeAndre had um, been paying for the different apps and things that find your phone. Oh, right. Yeah. So DeAndre, at the time, we had got some kind of thing that said Jelani's phone was in Morton, Illinois. And um, mm-hmm. so DeAndre had called the police up there because Morton is by Peoria. And which Peoria is nothing but like, another 45 minutes from Bloomington. So we got, he had got something that said Jelani's phone was there. So DeAndre was having the police check the the spot where, where this app was saying that Jelani's phone was. And at the same time we were looking up Peru and, and we were looking at all kinds of stuff, trying to figure out like what could, we, they were looking at the phone records. I'm looking at stuff. DeAndre was focused on the phone. Then while we were doing all of that, I get a text message from Kara. And it's an article saying that 
a car was found that's supposed to be, that may be the car of the missing ISU student. She sent that to you? She sent that to me. That's how she first found out. That's how I first found out. She sent that to me. Before police, an article. How how does she have, how does she know about this? It was was on the internet. It was on the internet. Oh. It was reported before the police even told them. Yeah. They had, uh, yeah, the, the news, well, this Shaw Media, they had already put an article out before the police even contacted me. So what comes to find what then I realized that when he's calling me, asking me about, do I know anybody in Peru? Because when I read the article, the car was found at four something that afternoon. He knew that when he had me on the phone, but oh, he never wow. told me. So it was like nine o'clock at night. I'm telling my kids when we get that article. We, let's go because it tells me where it's, it's at the YMCA in Peru, Illinois, and it was in some woods back there. So when he called me, and we were at the gas station. I will never forget. And we were getting gas, and he says to me, Carmen, I have some news. We they found what they believe to be Jelani's car, and I was like, I know. He said, How do you know? I said, Because it's on the internet. Which they first found out the car was missing because was it you or um, your brother? That went to the apartment with the police. DeAndre went to the apartment with the police. And the, and, the, and the car wasn't there. So we reported the car mm-hmm. along with Jelani missing. Mm-hmm. We got we gave them the license plate number. I had a friend. I work for the state. And so I know people that work at the um, the license, the um, secretary of the state, the driver's license bureau. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know Jelani's um, um, license plate His number. tags, yeah. So yeah. I called. And I was like, can you look up this up and give me what his tag number is? And they did that. And I gave it to the police. We were already looking for right. the car. It was already out there it that this there. car's missing. And the police are already starting to hint to you at this point that maybe Jelani was stressed and left on his own accord. Oh, he's and- asking me. Um, they asked us a lot of those questions. Um, and then was I'm he s- struggling with school? And did he, did he ever just get away before and not tell anybody? Mm. And we kept, we were very adamant with them about telling them like, no. That's not him. That's he said, not what Carmen, he would, would he hurt himself? I was telling him no. And um, that's when they found the car. And that Friday morning after they found, so they found the car and they didn't let me know that they found the car. I'm going my way and I get the phone call. He's telling me we found the car and I'm, I'm mad at, I'm mad at Paul now. And I'm telling him, I know you found the car. You knew you had the car when you had me on the phone earlier. He said, well, Carmen, I couldn't I couldn't tell you that because I was en route to the car. I said, but you couldn't tell me because according to this picture I'm looking at, there were people, there were so many people out there watching this whole thing and knowing that Jelani's car was there, but I didn't know. Yeah. And so I'm mad because you didn't make me aware. And I'm asking, he's talking about they had a search and they had drones and they... Um, Which you should have been at. I should have been there. Right. I should have been made aware when you had me on the phone that you knew that, that you were driving oh. to where his car was. But they didn't tell me anything. He didn't tell me anything. So when he called me that night and, I'm, and, he, and I tell him, I'm on my way. He said, you're on your way here, but it's two hours away. I said, I don't care. No, he told me it's three hours away. I said, I don't care how many hours it is. I'm on I'm my way go. there. Yeah. He said, well, when you get here, I need to let you know. I can't let you down there by the car because it's still a crime scene. He said, I can't let you go down to the car. You have to promise me that you won't go down there. I said, Paul, I'm coming to where you are. I won't disturb anything. And I asked him, I said, but did you find Jelani? He said he didn't see Jelani. I said, is there blood? He told me he didn't see any blood. I said, you don't see anything associated with Jelani? No, Carmen, we didn't find Jelani. So we get there. We drive all the way there. And as we're driving there, we drive across this bridge. And um, when we drove across that bridge, in I know I said it out loud because I remember Carlos telling me, Carmen, he's not down there. And um, I blocked it out of my mind because I didn't want to believe. I'm like, okay, he's not. Because I, I kept telling myself, I'm going to stay positive because I'm going to find him. I'm going to find him. And uh, we get there. And there's Paul Jones from Bloomington, Brad Jones from Peru and um, another police officer, a female police officer from Peru, they're all standing out there. And it's probably like 12 o'clock, almost 1 o'clock in the morning. And I'm asking them all kinds of questions. 
And I'm pissed because it's 12 o'clock in the morning. They found this car at 420. Almost eight hours ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm just now knowing about it at nine something at night. And it took me three hours to get there, too. So I'm pissed. I should have been there when everybody else was here. When you so I could have known what was being done or I could have seen whatever, but I wasn't made privy to none of that. So I asked them, do these cameras work? And there were no cameras on the side of the building that faced where Jelani Carr was. And I go, well, there's a camera right there. There was a camera on the YMCA. And he said, those cameras don't work. And I was like, well, that's stupid. Why do they have, why does the YMCA have cameras out here and they don't work? He was like, I don't know. Brad Jones, the, the officer from Peru, I don't know. He said, we've already asked, but the cameras don't work. Now, this is on that Thursday night, which is the 26th, okay? Okay. Um, that they told me the cameras didn't work. I also asked them that night, are you going to, where all did you guys search? He said they, they had this extensive search out there. They had the, the drones. They said they had dogs. They said they had um, people from, um, um, some search um, like organization search yeah, organization sure. that walked the um, distance of this wooded area now keep in mind it's midnight so I really can't see how long this wooded area is or what the right. the um, depth of it is or anything I just know that when I look down this hill Jelani's car is down there you can see it and I'm asking them so how did they how did they find his car? And he tells me that there was a, a young boy that saw the car down there and he went to work and didn't tell anybody. But then he went, came back on. So he saw the car down there on Tuesday. He came, left, didn't tell anybody. Wednesday when he came back to work, the car was still there. He goes and he tells the supervisor, or the director of the Y. And that's when the police were called. So the car had been down there for at least a day. And um, this young boy told them that the car was there. And that's when the police was called. And then they see this car down there and it doesn't have any license plates on it. Um, when they pull the car up the hill that night while we we're there, because they were waiting on the tow truck to get there when we were there. And uh, Paul Jones tells me that, it's not really protocol for this to happen, but because Peru doesn't have the equipment or the facilities to process the vehicle, that they're going to take the vehicle back to Bloomington to process it for fingerprints and DNA right. and all of that. And he said, we are not even going to go through the paperwork. So they didn't even initially do whatever it was they're supposed to do to sign stuff over. Right. They just was going to allow them to take the car and so they were waiting for a tow truck from Bloomington to come. Do you know if they even took pictures of the car before they moved it? I don't know that. Wow. They haven't shared barely. I don't know that. I know we or like I know inventory. that when they pulled when they pulled the car up, I'm the only one that didn't take pictures because I didn't have my phone. I had left my phone in the car and I didn't go back to get my phone. But I know my kids were taking pictures and they were asking questions because I was asking questions, but I wasn't there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. And um, Well, you're just trying to make sense of what's going on. Everything, because yeah. none of this made sense to me. They kept trying to allude to the fact that, due to the fact that Jelani had a suitcase, and oh. he, I mean, he was real, Jelani wasn't the neatest person, hmm. but, um, and he just came back from a trip. So, hmm. he he's not the one to, oh, let me go ahead and get this out the car. And yeah. Unpack it, right. put it away. Right. right. So they kept trying to allude that was he trying to get away from something? Was he, mm -hmm. did he, was he upset with you all? Or uh, did he just want to get away? Anything like that? And we kept on telling him like, no, that that's, that's not the case. Not the fact. Like he literally just got back from a trip. That's what we explained. He to literally them. had just got back on that Sunday. Jelani is not like Save said, Jelani is my messiest child. He eats, why, he 25 years old and he eats with his fingers. I have to get on Jelani all the time. I'm like, put your neck, don't touch me because his hands be nasty yeah, all the time. Sauce and so, yeah. he, he would eat with his fingers. He put his hands on the wall. I, if my, I got fingerprints <laughs> on my wall, it's Jelani. Yeah. So 
that stuff right there, him leaving his suitcase not in the car, that's not surprising yeah. for me. Was his car usually messy? Like, just stuff everywhere? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, this is his first car. Um, and, and keep in mind, Jelani you know, only so. had this car. He just got the car in June. He had it for a few months now. He only had it for a few months. We also, um, they kept trying to tell us, like, this is typical. You know, usually kids his age would have stuff have a, lot, have a lot of stuff going on you know he he was in a master's program he probably was stressed and needed to get away but we just kept trying to explain to him like no like that's this isn't how, how he would do it this yeah. isn't at all how he would do it he he's faced stress hmm. a lot of stress you know his dad was sick that stressed yeah. him his you know he was in programs that required a lot of his time and attention and he was able to keep his gpa and stuff up under all of this stress so it wasn't like Jelani couldn't handle stress. So let's let's back up a little bit here. I want to go back to the 24th and really go over the timeline so this is clear to people. Uh -huh. um, feel free to interrupt me if any if you want to add anything or anything about this is wrong. But security cameras captured Jelani's last known whereabouts on the 24th. There were two separate sightings of him that day. At 720, Jelani was spotted on camera at the Bone Student Center on campus. He was last seen wearing a blue button-up collared shirt black pants, black belt, um, black dress shoes, and a blue mask. It was during COVID. Right. And this is like a normal outfit for him for mm -hmm. during school. Um, and he's planning to go to class. Then the next sighting is 912. Security cameras at the Beyond slash Hello dispensary on Veterans Parkway oh, and uh, General Electric Road in Bloomington show Jelani walking into the store. This is footage that has been released. A lot of people have seen this. And there's been a lot of talk about him looking up into the camera. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe he was looking into the camera so that he could be let into the store like this was a protocol for the dispensary? Yeah, that's what I believe. Um, when I looked at that camera, when I looked at that picture and I seen Jelani walk, I, I seen him walk into the building. I seen him stand there, and pull out his ID to yeah. show yeah. him. Um, I didn't see anything that made me think like he was scared or. Um, something was wrong with him. Deeply troubled about. Yeah, I didn't, that I, didn't, I didn't see that with him in in that in that picture or the when I actually seen the actual video. I don't see anything that would alert me to think like, okay, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, what I didn't I didn't see the video of him in the store buying anything, but I was able to see the video of him walking out. Um, in and out. In and out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this time he's in a completely different outfit. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he He's went home and changed his clothes. So what that tells me is that something. So what my conclusion was, because I seen on the video that Jelani walking around campus. When I find out that Jelani is missing some information about his TB test. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the inf that's what he is supposed to have for Kara. That's part of the program that he needed to have done to start his clinicals and all that kind of stuff. He had to have his TB test done. Um, Jelani, I come to find out that he had made the appointment because he had had one part of it done in Champaign because he was on my insurance. So I was able to look and see that he had done that. I was able to also see that he had made an appointment to go get that second part done. So I, what I was assuming was that when he was on campus that morning and he was at that front desk, he was probably inquiring about that medical office because mm, that's where mm -hmm. he ended up going to the medical office. And at the medical office, um, you could see him at the front desk asking something. I don't know what he asked him, but I'm assuming he asked maybe if he could take care of it that day there because he knew he didn't take care of his business on time. And he had his clinicals that day. They must have told him no, because I'm figuring that he left went home and changed his clothes and was going to go to Champagne to the appointment that was scheduled for him to do the second part of the, um, the TB test. Yeah, thing. that makes sense. Yeah. So that's what made sense to me of him changing his clothes. Cause I kept thinking what made him change his clothes mm -hmm. because he, he knew his, he was excited about this clinicals. He kept telling me, mom, I got clinicals. I'm going to see my first patient and all this kind of stuff. Um, and the only thing that would deter him was that if something occurred, something happened, somebody, right. something happened. So until I know different, this is just me assuming that I know that that's my correct mm -hmm. answer mm -hmm. about what he was doing. Um, I'm not 100% certain. I'm just going back because I've retracted this 
a million times in yeah. my mind. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the part that makes sense to me. Now, the part that what doesn't make sense to me is that he gets back in his car to leave that dispensary and he disappears. His outfit that he changed into is a blue Detroit Lions baseball cap, a Jimi Hendrix band tee, light colored shoes, black shoes with white soles. Um, so white this, colored shorts and the gray color shirt. Okay. Yeah. So the the first sighting seven twenty. This is nine fifteen. Not not much later. Nine twelve to be specific. Mm -hmm. So then, let's talk about the car at the dispensary. Mm -hmm. You believe that the car, and I believe too, that it was left on and running when he went into the store, which is unusual unless someone else is in the car. When I was able to see the video of the car, um, when Jelani gets in the car, when you start up a car, you can tell if you're starting up because you you know what the, yeah. the back lights look lights like when you start. Flick on, that they yeah. flick on, right? Yep. In this instance, Jelani got in the car and you see the brake lights come on which indicate you have to put the brake lights on to put the car in reverse, right? You're not starting up. They didn't blink. They stayed on for a second because it indicates that you're putting the car in reverse because that you see the lights come on. You see the car move back. The car was on. I didn't see him start up the car. You can tell when you're starting up the car because of how the lights come on when you start them up. Mm -hmm. Did Versus, his car have remote start? No, he no. didn't have a remote start. He didn't start. have a remote start. No, he didn't have a remote okay. start on that car. When I see the car leaving out of the parking lot, yeah. of the dispensary I see I had them rewind that tape for me a couple of times because I see a shape mm -hmm. in the back of that car they told me there was a shadow or it was the back of the headrest right. um, I have a Chrysler um, 300 as well mine is a 17 um, so I went outside that day and I looked at the back of my car and sure enough, that you can see the headrest. I go back in there again and rewind that video. You see the headrest, but there is a shape. Beyond I, the headrest. Beyond yeah. the headrest. And I tell them, there's somebody in that car. I'm like, Save, look at somebody in the car. And Save's looking with me. Um, Zaina was looking. Zaina was there with us. You are there. Yeah. All of us are there. You know, we're looking and um, Todd McCloskey, the detective from Bloomington, he said, Carmen, no, that's a shadow. Um, I'm like, but Jelani's windows are tinted. He said um, that they that they looked at it. They don't think that there was anybody in there. And plus, it's on the passenger side where I'm saying I see this the shape of the hair, right? And he's like, well, that doesn't make sense because why wouldn't they be on the behind him? I was like, I don't know. You tell me why they wouldn't be behind him. Now, this is in February of 2022 when I see this video. It was on February the 14th um, of 2022 when they show us this video. Well, I, I might have the date wrong, but it was in February. Um, and, um, it wasn't until August of 2022 when I actually see Jelani's car for myself with my own two eyes. And it makes sense to me why somebody, why I know that I wasn't seeing things and why if there was someone in the car when I say it's on the passenger side, why it makes sense. Because when I got to that police station and I see his car, the same suitcase that was in his car the night they pulled up the car from the hill. This is when you actually saw the physical car, not just when the I. When I, I didn't see a picture, I physically saw the car. Right. Suitcase still the inside. The suitcase is still right there behind the driver's side, which would make sense why I see somebody on the passenger side because that's where that suitcase was at. Right. The suitcase is still there. So when they told me they processed the car, in my mind, you've taken out all, everything out of the car. There shouldn't be no suitcase in the car anymore. And this was very recently. Yeah, I saw the, I saw the car, physically saw the car in August of 22. Mm-hmm. In August of 22, when I saw the car, um, the car, which is supposed to be a major piece of evidence, um, Jelani, the Sarah, the police chief from Peru, Illinois, had called me a day prior because this is like on August 18th. I was in Peru um, 
I was doing a, a they were doing a follow up with the news station because it was going to be a, a year since Jelani had went missing, and uh, Sarah had called me the day before and asked me, "Did I want the car back?" And I was like, "Yeah, if you're gonna give it back to me, but you don't need it." She was like, "No, we don't have the room, and we figured that we give it back to you because we're not we got what we needed out of the car." I'm like, "Okay." Um. I didn't tell her I was coming down there the next day. But while I was there, something told me to go see the car. When I called her, she was already gone, but she told me that they would let me come in there and see the car. Um, I had to let her know that I had the news people with me. And she said, well, I'm not going to let them go in there with you, but you can go in there and see the car. And the police officer that was there from Peru, he said, well, I can tell you how we can solve this. He said, there's a fence where the car is. And I was like, a fence? Isn't the car in the security area? He's like, no, the car is outside. I'm like, outside? He said, but there's a fence and she can take her cameras around the fence and she can see because the, 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 um, it's visible. She has a clear, a clear visible path where she can still film you. Mm. So, she goes around the building. They drive her, her and her cameraman. They drive around the building. I go through the building with them, and they take me out in this back. And there sits Jelani Carr under this tarp. And as I, as each second goes, I'm getting angrier and angrier and angrier, because, to me, they have not taken care of this major piece of evidence. Number one, when he removes the tarp off the car, every seal on the door is broken. So I'm looking and I'm I'm asking, I was like, how is this car secured? So you could just reach in? You could just open the, well, the doors were locked. And Do- the, the doors were, were locked, but the seals on the door. Okay. Because this is a piece of evidence. So, you know, if you go in and out of a piece of evidence like this, you would assume that they would still label the car. that, And mm-hmm. that's what they did in the beginning. Because you could see, you could see that each time they've been in the car, when on the first date, the first date on there, it has August 26th and it has, it's signed off. It has a person's signature on there. Okay. Then it shows the next time the door was open was a different date and it had that person's signature on there. And I remember the last date on the tape said December something and it had that person's signature on there. But after that, every last seal on the doors, all those seals are cut through. Oh God. They're all cut through. But the doors are locked. But the seals, it, the car is not sealed up again. So, it would indicate to you who's been in and out of the car because that's what you're supposed to do to evidence. Mm-hmm. I took criminal justice classes and they, they taught us that that's what you do with evidence. I even yeah. had to go back and read my book. Like the evidence is supposed to be labeled tagged. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be put in an evidence Secured, report. Secured, Yeah. And everything was just sitting in there. And so I'm like, I asked that there's two officers with me and I'm asking them. So where is the, uh, where are the keys? He says, I don't know. We'll, we'll get them for you. We'll get them for you. I said, okay. He's he's calling somebody to get the keys for me. And the other officer that's standing there, and I'm like, does this make sense to you? And he doesn't know how to answer me. He's just looking at me. I said, tell me this. If this was your child and you come to see this piece of evidence, what would you be thinking right now? He's. He was like, I would be just as frustrated as you, but I just want you to know I had nothing to do with this. He said, I am just a patrol officer. I don't handle the um, evidence. You'd have to speak to an evidence technician. I said, well, get them out here. He said, they're all gone home. So the other officer is calling Sarah. He's calling there, calling whoever he needs to call. He, he gets the keys. And I'm like, okay. I thought, because initially they told me they didn't have, they never found Jelani's keys. So I'm asking them then, how did you get in and out of this car? And that's when he told me he had keys. I said, so when did you guys get keys? And he said, well, we've had the keys. So what they explained to me is that they had the keys um, made. They had a key fob made for Jelani's car, programmed it. Well, when he gets the key fob, it's not working. 
to get us in the car. And if you know anything about those key fobs, you know that they have a, if you don't have the, you can't use the key fob. There's actual a key inside the right. key fob, right? But that key is missing. Because I'm like, where's the key at? Because now we can't unlock the door, car. And, and now I'm making a big deal about getting in the car. I'm like, I want to get in the car. Since y'all got the, the seals are broken, I want to see. Because now I'm looking through the windows and I see money on the seat. I see paper on the seat. I see stuff on the floor. I see the suitcase in the back seat. I see shoes on the floor. I see the the the, uh, the passenger side seat has been pulled down. There's all stuff in Jelani's trunk that's laying on top of this seat. Everything is just everywhere. And I'm asking all kinds of questions. And the, these officers that are out here, they don't they don't have the answers. He's this one officer, if he could have, he would have given me everything. He's like, well, do you have, he's, he's telling me about all these different reports that, that he's seeing that they have. And that, um, he, he's telling me that there are, um, he said, I, I said, well, why isn't this stuff bagged and tagged? He said, I don't know. He said, it should be, you're right. It should be. But it's not. He said, I don't. He said, I can't tell you why they didn't do it like that. I said, so why is this car parked out here? <laughs> he said, I don't know. He said, it's been out here. That's when he tells me it's been out there for three weeks in the elements for three wow. weeks. He said, it had to be at least three weeks because I came to work one day and it was out here. And I said, well. He said, I can show you where they're supposed to keep the stuff because according to Sarah now I, I've had them call her I'm like so why is Jelani's car out here and she's telling me they didn't have room in the secured area to keep his car so I they finally get a, a thing that you jimmy the door with and that's how they unlock the door I get in the car so now I'm in the car and whatever's in there they let me get in there I'm contaminating it too right mm-hmm I'm videoing them at the same time. I'm showing everybody because I went live on social media to show them this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I've had to deal with. I've taken pictures. I've recorded the police officers. And now I'm saying, show me the security area where this car was supposed to be at. So they take me to this garage where the car was supposed to be at, that it was supposed to be a security area. And they lift, it's a, a garage, and they raise up the garage door. The secured area. <laughs> yeah. There's only two cars in this garage. Two. But they don't have room to have Jelani's car in the secured area. And I'm asking them, why isn't, it, isn't his car in here? There's nothing in here. Then they're, they're both standing there. They're clueless. I don't know. I can't explain it to you. I, we don't know why they didn't have his car in here. So I'm like, I need to speak to Sarah. I need to know this. And she won't. And now she's not even answering the calls anymore. She's not answering the calls. She's not responding to the police officers anymore. Oh, and I'm wow. still at the police station. So you're uh, thinking they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Wow. So while they're telling me that they found DNA and it was only Jelani's DNA and fingerprints on the car because they checked the the um, the the door, steering hand, the steering wheel, the door handle, handle the straw and the the thing that the joint came in that he bought from. Yeah. Of course, his fingerprints and DNA would be on all that stuff. And is that the only thing that he bought at the dispenser? Just one joint? Uh, that's all I know of. Okay. That's all that's I know all of. we could find too. Those are the only things that he found, that they found his DNA and fingerprints on. And that's the only, those are the only DNA and fingerprints that they found in the car. But. They what about, yeah. They, what about all the other stuff in the, there? Right. Yeah. How how would you know if there was any other? Seems like they went for the most obvious things that yeah. would have his DNA on it, exactly. rather than what would somebody else sitting in here be touching. And so mm. when I've asked those questions, that's 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 a current question that's on them right now that I oh, posed really? to them wow. within the past two months. I've wanted to know how does this how did they come about processing this car? I've been gaslighted this whole entire time. First, Absolutely. Peru told me. You need to ask Bloomington because Bloomington is the one that processed the car. So when I ask Bloomington, they direct me to the state police. The state police now are telling me that they've got a guy that they're going to have me speak to 
that does the process. He's not the one that processed the car, but maybe he'll be able to give me or shed some kind of light on it to help me to understand how they did everything. To this day, which is now July, what, the 18th or 19th? I don't know what today is. But whatever today is, to this day, I've asked this question two months ago in a meeting that I've had with the task force. And nobody can answer this? And nobody has answered me yet. That's shocking. (laughs) How can they not answer this? They should all know. Let's, it's let's, got to be in a re- like. Yeah, there's got to be a report or something. Or have you have they shown you any of the the results from the DNA tests or anything like that? No, they've shown no. They, they've, they've they just are her verbally telling nothing. you. Yeah, that. this is all verbally what they've told me. Mm-hmm. Wow, mm-hmm. that is that is so shocking. Doesn't make any sense either. So going back to the twenty fourth, goes to the dispenser at nine twelve, then his phone is turned off at nine twenty one. Mm-hmm. Jumping to the 26th, two days later, the car is discovered. Mm -hmm. It had been abandoned in Peru, Illinois. Now, that is strange in itself. Um, Mm -hmm. Peru is a sundown town. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you explain to people what that means? It's a a sundown town is a town that after, when it gets dark, nobody looking like me, nobody black should be found in that town. Mm Mm-hmm. So Jelani never would have been there. No. Had no reason to be there. Knew no one there. No. So this was extremely weird to you. I mean, you hadn't even heard of Peru. So the following day, the 27th, mm-hmm. Officer John Furman, who is the public officer, information officer for uh, Bloomington Police Department, he stated that, you know, we found Jelani's car and that Jelani went missing under unexplained suspicious circumstances. They also asked the public to report if they had seen Jelani or his car any time from the 24th to the 26th of August, particularly between the times of 7 a.m. and 4.20 p.m. So a tip came in that a house in LaSalle with security cameras found footage from August 25th of a black male knocking on their front door. When nobody answers, he walks away. Um, it took the police a very long time to make this footage public and share it with the family. But ultimately, after viewing it, they were able to confirm that it was not Jelani. Keep in mind um, that that's the part that's not true. Okay. Okay, so that video coverage that they released in September of that young man, because they didn't release that video coverage to the public until after they identified the body as Jelani. Okay. I first, they first sent me that video on August 27th. Um, I told them, because they, the question that he asked me, I'm going to send you this video. Is this Jelani? I looked at the video. I told him that was not Jelani. I asked him, why was he sending me this video? He said this was a video off of a, a ring camera that was in that area during that time. And then they were questioning why this young black boy was knocking on this person's door. Um, because I, I said that wasn't Jelani. They never to my knowledge, followed up on that video until we got there on September 24th. They identified Jelani's body as Jelani told me that was Jelani. And it was that night they um, made a Facebook. Post. They made a Facebook post um, and said, does anybody recognize this young man? And they put that video out there like it was a brand new piece of evidence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like it was something that we weren't, that's something that you should have put out there a month ago, a month prior, because now you're putting it out there and you don't have, you telling me that you don't have any leads. And if this, if this young man did have anything to do with it, why are you waiting 30 days to even find out if anybody's seen something? Again, I, I tell you the urgency was never there. So I was very upset. We, and, we were asking, could we post that video when we initially got it yeah. from them? And mm-hmm. asking if we can use like social media to figure out what's going on. Who is this? Who is this at this door? Right. And they didn't. They just told us not to do it. But 30, 30 plus days later, because I believe it was longer than that, um, they put it out there, and that's when they found out later on who that person was. When this could have been like some. What if this was somebody substantial or? Anything like that. Yeah, it would be important to figure that out. You know, he did it on September 24th because that's when I put, I made a Facebook post and I made the public aware of what they did and how they did it. 
And um, that's when he asked me to um, take it down. He couldn't imagine what I was going through. Um, He says to me, he knows I'm hurting, but can I remove the screenshot of our conversation off of Facebook? And I told him I wouldn't. I'm not. I said, because you, you're doing, they made it appear that they were doing a job that they weren't doing. Because Mm -hmm. I wanted to find out who this person was 30 days prior. But again, that goes back to me telling you how cooperative I was being with them and letting them do their part. And then they come back on the back end and it's like a smack in my face. Because this is something we should have been looking at. Now you identify this body as his and now you want to find out who this person was. And not only do you want to find out this person was, now you want to say you got a black male suspect. You been and had this black male suspect. We had white male suspects too, but you didn't put no videos out there and put anything out there about them. But now you got this one you want to put out there. It, it just pissed me off. Yeah. I don't blame it doesn't you. make any it sense. pissed me off too. And you talked to Paul the detective on Friday the 27th. Did he call you? This is when he said he was going home for the weekend. Yeah, the 27th. That's the same day I first really got that. I got that video on that day too. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That's okay. the same day. He called me about four something that afternoon. Um, he told me that he was waiting on, because at that time we were looking for things from Apple. We were trying to get things from Apple because he was telling me we had to go through this whole long subpoena process. And um, I had found some things. And then I actually knew somebody that worked with Apple that was on the board with some people at Apple. And I was like, no, we don't have to go. We can cut corners. I got I got connections with someone. And um, he called, he said, well, Carmen, if I don't hear anything, I'm getting ready to go home. I leave at five o'clock. And if I don't hear anything, I'll contact you on Monday. And I sat there because they told me that Friday, do not move. Carmen, we're going to be looking for Jelani. Can you please just trust us? Don't do anything. Stay home. That whole day, I did nothing. I did nothing. And he called me that afternoon, told me if I didn't hear from him, that he would call me on Monday. And I said, so what am I supposed to do between now and Monday? He said, well, what what are you going to do? I said, so nobody's going to be looking for Jelani? He said, Carmen, where are we supposed to look? I said, I don't know. I said, so would it be anything wrong with me starting a search? He said, Carmen, where are you going to look? I said, Paul, we got to search where his car was. We got to search back. Go back. I'm going back to Peru. He said, well, you just need to contact the Peru, Peru Police Department, but I don't think uh, there'll be anything wrong with it. Do you know? He, he was asking me about who I was going to take with me. I said, can your officer go with me? He said, Carmen, we don't have the manpower. Mm, my God. So it was on that day that I made the post on Facebook about I didn't know what I was doing. I've never done this before, but anybody that could, could they join me and my family that next day in Peru, Illinois? And the only place I could think of to meet was at the YMCA because that's the only place I knew there. And that's what we did. Was there a decent turnout? The turnout was bigger than I could have imagined. It was. Um, We got a lot of people come meet up. We met at the Planet Fitness in the parking lot. There were people, Jelani's friends um, showed up from Alabama. Alabama. Wow. From Texas. Wow. People showed up that I didn't even, I didn't, I wouldn't have dared thought that they would travel like that. My brother flew in from Vegas. He didn't even tell me he was coming. Wow. In a day's notice, he came. People that we didn't even know showed up. It was people were just out there helping us. So then September 2nd, Jelani's wallet was found, correct? I'm not for sure of the date, but I know it was found. Yeah. Okay. And there's a lot of conflicting information about how Mm -hmm. it was found, who it was found by. Do you have you been able to get a for sure answer on that? From what I was told, his wallet was seeing um, a man was going to work or 
or something getting up that morning going to work and saw a young saw a black male walking and throwed his wallet in the yard the black male had on a red top or a red bottom and he remembers distinctly that it was a black male and that he believes it was Jelani and he knows what time it was because he was getting up up and going to work that morning okay see and it's been police it's been reported police found it's been reported that a female found it um so i mean that's just another example of so much misinformation out there uh what did you think when the wallet was found and the wallet was found about a half a mile from his car correct Mm -hmm. in somebody's yard yeah in a neighborhood yeah which is incredibly strange obviously he didn't go and throw his wallet into someone's yard yeah and there's one report that cites a um email that was foid um saying that this young man was looking for their drone his drone had gps and when he couldn't find it he called his mother then tracked the drone and while looking for it he found the wallet right that was like one of the first ones they came out with Mm -hmm. it was supposed to be in a um his father a recognized boy and the his name. dad. Right. Uh-huh. And they were looking for something and um they end up finding Jelani's wallet. So mm. I've been told both of those things. You think there'd be just one answer. But you gotta remember, I've been told both of those things by the police too. What about his clothes? The clothes he had on. Mm-hmm. They were found. Um so many stories out there about that too. Well, we were told on the 22nd of September, well, I was told that two board students from um, ISU um, went to see if they could, they had been watching everything online about Jelani and they had been watching and wanted to know if they could help. And so they went down to where the body was found um, and they asked someone where did they search and where did they find the body and the person told them that the police went they went searched that way but they didn't go that way and so the girls went and walked up the river bank and a mile from where his body was found they found his clothing they found his shoes some socks and some shorts you have pictures of those and you're not sure if you want to release them. You can think yeah. about that. Let us know. And yeah. we're happy to share those if you want. Um, so then that morning, approximately 947, the search team found an unidentified body. They found that body on September 4th. So right. the clothing, the clothing was found after the body. Okay. So keep in mind that Illinois search and rescue and the police and everybody was out there and they found this body, right? Mm -hmm. So the body was found. They didn't identify this body as Jelani because the body was so badly decomposed. Yeah, it was found floating near the south bank of the Illinois River, approximately a quarter mile east of Illinois Route uh, 251 Bridge. Right. Um, this is only about a mile from where his car was found mm -hmm. and there was no identifying information on his body. So you didn't think it was Jelani at first. So no, when they um, took us there and they took us to the room and they told us that they found this body and I asked them, what did the, what did it have on? They told me that it would had on a, um, a white beater. That's what they called the shirt. And they, I asked him what color it was. He said he couldn't identify it because it was murky. Mm. It was discolored from the water. Um, the body had on some underwear, it had a sweatshirt wrapped around, tied around the waist. And that's all they told me that the, the clothing wise that the body had on. They couldn't tell whether there was a black or Hispanic. I'm sorry, but they believe that it mm. was because they could tell by the structure of the face is what he told us. The bone structure. Um, um, the, the body was badly decomposed. The, um, there was fish and um, turtles, turtle activity, larvae in the eye sockets, um, missing the front teeth. And he, and he told us which the teeth it was. There was missing teeth. Um, 
They couldn't identify it by the fingerprints because how the body had been in the water and the fish and turtle activity on the flesh. So they had to use the dental records. Um, So some of his teeth were found missing when his body was found. There was the front teeth were missing. Okay. It was it was several teeth in his front part of his mouth missing. Okay, that's been a big point of confusion Um, in reporting too. mm Mm-hmm. The teeth were missing, yeah. Um, Not all of them. And when when I when we asked, did they fall out or were they like broken? Mm -hmm. They couldn't tell us that. What they told us was is that they made it appear that they had fallen out because he told us that they came out. It could be due to the body being in the water for Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. number of days, Mm -hmm. but still that doesn't make sense because if you research. Body Mummies something. have kept their teeth. Yeah, that's I've never heard of that for years. In the water, they j- number one. I can tell you, Jelani didn't have bad teeth. Out of all five of my kids, Jelani was the one that didn't have the cavities. Mm. Um, I just had the dentist. I have a dentist that ha- well that when they got his records, she looked at them just for me like three months ago, and she showed me the top of his teeth where she says. They were strong up here that there was no decay or anything mm. that would have made them just to fall out. And I asked her to check um, to see, is it common that if bodies, are, if bodies when they're face down in the water, if the teeth just automatically fall out? And she told me that she was going to get back with me. But um, what she did find out was that it's not um, something that is common for them to just find out, fall out because if that was the case, then they all would have fallen out. Right, right. Or they all would have been loose and fallen out. And that wasn't the case. So again, it's summertime. The river's water temperature is, you know, much higher. 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that obviously speeds up decomposition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately. But at this point, you guys are holding out hope that it's, it's not Jelani. We are. We are. And then three weeks went by with nothing. Um, September 20th, police announced that they're still investigating, haven't identified the body at that point. And during all of this, Gabby Petito has gone missing and there's been so much coverage. And can you explain how you felt during that time seeing her family get so much coverage? And I know that you've said you know, many times that you don't think she should have gotten less coverage, but you wished your son got much more. Absolutely. Um, I felt I was angry at not at her family because it's not their fault. I was angry at the mm-hmm. the press. I was angry at the police because I looked at her and when I heard what the circumstances of her case was, especially about the part about when her parents reported her missing, they hadn't heard from her for a week before they reported her missing. Right? I hadn't heard from Jelani for one day when I reported him missing. And I still wasn't getting the coverage or the assistance or the help. Mm -hmm. They didn't hear from her for a week and then they reported her missing. And instantly they had the media, the social. I mean, Gabby was everywhere. Mm -hmm. You couldn't turn on your TV without a commercial coming on and somebody looking at CNN and you could see it across your screen or somebody talking about her or you could pull up Instagram and you see her picture flash before you or Facebook and you scroll up and you see her. I didn't get that with Jelani Day. Mm -hmm. And so it was just, it angered me because of the the disparity. Yeah. That's the part that angered me Mm -hmm. because we deserved just as much. Not that they didn't deserve it because they did, but we also did too. Jelani was important. He is important just like Gabby is. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, my heart went out to her mother and her father. Of course, yeah. But you sh- you guys should have gotten the same. And, you know, we were trying to cover both cases at the time. And I remember there was just so many less resources available on Jelani and, and so much misinformation on Jelani versus Gabby. I mean, there was endless resources for us to pull from. Um, you know, somebody really from the media told me when I brought that, when I had brought up the disparity and then I started getting contact from the media. I'll never forget this reporter told me. She said, um, 
Well, one of the reasons that we didn't cover Jelani is because he had no social media presence. Gabby was a blogger and she had social media presence. Mm -hmm. And I Mm -hmm. said, are you serious right now? No. So you telling me because Jelani didn't have an Instagram, an active Instagram account and he didn't have Facebook. That's why you didn't cover Uh, him? I mean, I I think she's trying to make the point that that's why there were so many people that had she already had like a following that were, you know, covering it. But there's no excuse for the media. I mean, there's no reason why they would cover one person who has more of a presence than another. I mean, it just doesn't make those, any sense. That's what she told me, though. Yeah, of course, because that's the excuse they always like to use. Um, so then let's go to September 22nd. You called the coroner. Um, he has very basic information about the process and the status, the status of the investigation. And the coroner was extremely disrespectful to you. But tell everybody about this, this oh, coroner. Yeah. Richard Plock is his name. He's the coroner for LaSalle County. And um, he was very disrespectful. Um, that day he called me and he said um, that they were going to be able to um, he he asked me, he said, um, do you want to find out if this is your son or not? I said, I've, no, at first he asked me about the dental records. And I said, well, I've sent you dental records. And he said, um, well, did Jelani go to the dentist in Michigan? And I couldn't remember. And I was like, then I thought about it. And I was like, yeah, because he chipped his tooth. Um I was like, yes. Um, and he said, um, well, we, we've we had a, um, a forensic, um, what do you call it, odontologist mm-hmm. that um, we're sending those dental records to. And um, we want to know if you can be here uh, tomorrow to know if this is your son. And I said, but wait a minute. I thought you didn't, you couldn't use the dental records because he kept telling me he couldn't use the dental records. Mm -hmm. I said, what about the DNA? I said, you just told me the other day that you didn't have the chemical, that the state lab didn't have the chemical to process the DNA. He said, Carmen, you're making me so angry. Look, either you want to know this is your son or not. Oh my gosh. And at the time, he didn't know that I had on the phone with me the private investigator and the attorney that I had at the time. He didn't know that they were on the phone with me. And um, he was being so disrespectful to me. And then finally, um, my attorney at the time, Hallie Besner, she jumped in and she said, "Um, you don't talk to her like that. Good for her. And... um, he he kept he kept getting smart and being loud and he didn't realize he thought it was me talking to him mm-hmm. and he was saying I can talk to you any kind of way I want to and then she was like hey hey and she had to curse at him and he was like who am I speaking to and she identified herself and then his whole tone changed of course of course his whole entire tone changed and he said that she was just making me upset but I have I want to know if she wanted to be here tomorrow because um we we've got this out intelligence and we'll have the results tomorrow and all this kind of stuff. And then um, she was letting them know that she was going to be present with me tomorrow, that next day, which would have been the 24th. And my, the investigator that was on the phone with us at the time, he, he also let him know how disrespectful and rude that he was and that he would be present that next day. Um, if I hadn't had them on the phone, you know, they would have made it seem like I'm just making up these stories about how they were treating me oh, and how yeah. they were talking to me. For sure. Um, we got there that next day. And all of a sudden they had the answer that this was Jelani. They identified him by the dental. That was September 23rd. That was September 24th. 24th the 24th the 23rd was the day when he asked me about the dental records and he was being mean and nasty to me okay the 22nd was the day that they found the clothing the 23rd was the day they wanted me that he called me on the phone 
about the dental records and wanting to know if I wanted to be there on the 20, if I could be there on the 24th. And then when the 24th was the day that we were there, my family, the attorney, the private investigator, and he identified that body as Jelani. What was your reaction? I remember hearing them, and I remember sitting there. I remember hearing Jelani's dad crying. I remember Zaina crying. I remember... uh, I remember the investigator telling them about how I was treated on the phone. I remember Carlos letting him know that how he talked to me was wrong, that they couldn't talk to me like that. I remember him then, us asking questions. I remember Seve asking them questions. And I was really just trying to process Mm -hmm. that they was telling me that this body was Jelani and how I had to make arrangements for the uh, funeral director to pick it up. (laughs) And then... I can remember me getting so angry and I I cursed everybody in their room out. I remember having to apologize to my mom and I left out of there. Mm. And I'm outside and that's when that's when I met Sarah. She walked up to me and she said that she was sorry about hearing that that was Jelani and that I was right, nothing made sense, and that starting today, we're going to start over like it's day number one, Mm. and we're going to review this case, and we're going to find out what happened to your son. What's Sarah's last name? Sarah Raymond. And what's her role? At that time, she was the deputy chief. Okay. Okay. As of today, she's the police chief of Peru. Okay. She was the contact person Mm -hmm. for me, for the um, police department. Seve, what was your reaction? Um, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it at all. I had a lot of um, questions about how they came to that conclusion. Also about uh, the different type of testing they did. Mm Um. They were trying to describe what the body, tell, well, that was also at the time when they were telling us we couldn't see the body, they didn't want us to see it. Um, and while they were trying to explain to us about how a body is decomposed in the water, um, at that same time, uh, me and my siblings and uncles, we did some research on how other bodies are looked up. Like we Google searched it, we looked at different websites, uh, um different it's a i can't think of the name of this of this place but they actually look at drowned victims and they have a whole twitter account that is linked to different drowned victims Mm. and different cases dealing with that and so certain bodies were in there for more than the 10 days or 20 plus or a month and you could still see skin coloration or eye sockets eye sockets are still in the eyes um hair follicles, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because they told us Jelani didn't have any eyeball. But in Jelani's case, it wasn't the case for him, and it was unidentifiable. Mm-hmm. So I just had a lot of questions because I didn't uh, believe it to be true at all. Were they telling you at all what they thought happened or anything? Like They tried. They gave us a... Uh, they gave us a a paper um, about, from Google, about uh, drowning. Mm. And 
you should know this about drowned victims or whatever. Um, they kept alluding to the. So fact. they're alluding. They're not flat no, out saying. They haven't given you they, a. Right. They kept alluding to the fact that Jelani drowned himself. They and that I, he took and his I, clothes and off. He took his clothes off. Walked around walked through Peru, that town, Peru. Parked his car in the woods parked, and then walked around again in his and, underwear. And went down to the river and drowned himself. And of course, you know that's nonsense. It didn't even. It, it don't even that make doesn't sense. Even sound no, it don't even make it's ridiculous. sense. Ridiculous. How does that even make sense? That you park your car. Take your license place out. Drive over an hour to the place that is at. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Even do it. If you're going to kill you, it, it was a, like I told them, there was water. There's a lake and water in Bloomington. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why would he drive all the way to Peru? And if you go to the place where his car was at, Johnny wouldn't have never. You, you wouldn't even know that place even existed unless you are from that town. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't. You wouldn't think to just go. You have to know that area yeah. to know where Jelani's car was. You just don't it. stumble yeah. upon that. Mm-hmm. That's a really good point. And we talked about this yesterday, but being such an avid swimmer, it's like impossible to drown yourself. He never drowned. He he didn't drown. No, of course not. They didn't even find l- water in his lungs. Right, right. And... So they advised you guys not to view the body. However, Seve, you made the choice to to see him anyway. I'm sure that wasn't easy, but you felt it needed to be done. Right. Uh, I needed to. Um, I wanted to because everything they were saying just didn't add up to me. Um, After looking at certain different things, I wanted to see myself about, okay, how bad is this? the main thing they want to say is uh, they have people they deal with to this day that see their relatives in that type of shape and they they have uh, mental issues or uh, mental. nightmares, stuff like that. They just mm-hmm. try to tell us everything like this, but um, they don't want me to remember him like that, but I'm not going to remember my brother like that. I know who my brother mm-hmm. is. I know, mm-hmm. I know, I know him. Right. So that seeing, seeing that it's not going to, um, it's, it's in my mind, but I'm not going to say, okay, that's him. That's that's how I remember him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to see, I want to see if I could see the clothing. I want to see if I could see a lot of, a lot of things uh, about the body um, to make sure and verify it was like him actually. Um, but looking at the body, um, it was, it was a mess. Um Yeah, you you really couldn't tell it was him. Um, so Ave was the one that um, it was my kids that pushed me for the second autopsy and the, um, the third one, especially Save because Save was getting upset with me a little bit because I was part of me was I was tired. And um, I was um, I was tired, and then when they told me that that was Jelani, it was. I was just like, how could they be telling the story now? And like, then they told me that I didn't didn't want to see him like that, and so that was bothering me. And then finally, I listened to my kids, and I had the second autopsy. And um, to hear um, the results from the second autopsy, I was, I think that was, that that even, it was hurtful and it fueled me more because I had even more questions. Um, the, the, the man from the second autopsy had told us that um, he didn't even know. He said, how do you know that this is your son? And I said, because that's what they told me. And he says to, um, well, there's no, he said, I wouldn't even know if this was your son. I can't even determine if this was a male or a female because the genitalia is. Um, God, They called it flayed or something. Yeah, it's, it was flayed. They used a word like that. He told me that the only reason that I knew that this was your son because it was a dog, uh, what he called a toe tag. 
on him. Without the toe tag, I wouldn't be able to identify this as your son. He said, uh, why is his uh why is his jawbone removed? I was like, I don't know. He said, Well, whoever did this, they mutilated the body. He said, I've been doing this for over fifty years. Um he said the um the uh this the the liver and the spleen were mush he said there was just it was just mush that's the autopsy of the second he says this person was a 25 year old man he was reported to have been found in a river after being considered missing for some unknown period of time this is a second look autopsy performed after an initial examination done elsewhere by another examiner he said the external description the body is received in a standard body bag. Name tags attached to the outer aspect of the bag identify the body as Jelani Day. No name tags or other identifying materials are present anywhere else, including on the body. The body shows extensive destruction. No hair is present on the head. The top part of the skull is sawed off. The flesh of the, fla- of the face has been removed precluding any attempts oh to identify the person. Racial classification is impossible. The eyeballs are absent. Many of the teeth are missing, and the mandible is sawed in an oblique manner with part of the mandible missing. The neck is open. The chest plate is removed. got to read all of it. I just want to all of that was happening to Jelani's body, right? Mm-hmm. Wow. So and this is the report from the second autopsy. This is from the second autopsy. Yeah. Which just quickly to provide some context for mm-hmm. our listeners. So LaSalle County coroner, we were talking about earlier, he did the first autopsy. No, which, the first autopsy was yeah. done by Steve Denton. Scott Denton. Scott Sorry. Denton. Denton. September 5th. He's, he's a pathologist, um, a forensic pathologist Correct. out of McLean County. Out of which McLean is, County. Which is Bloomington. And okay. that was one day after the body was discovered. Mm-hmm. Um, the d- second d- autopsy was... The second autopsy right. is and one that I his, paid for. Yeah, mm-hmm. they gave us his credentials that day, too. They tried to give us his credentials about how long he's been doing this and why we should, you know, take what he's saying as credible. Um, Denton's. Denton. Right. His report. So mm-hmm. they're right. trying to get you to accept his report. Right, yeah. and that's why they also added that Google, Google search about drowning and everything else. Because that was his conclusion. That yeah. was his yeah. conclusion. That... Jelani but Brown. he also said in there that they can't say that Jelani drowned, but because the body was found in a body right. of water, okay. that's why they wanted to say the cause of death was drowning. They didn't have a manner of death. They only had a cause of death. And I told them, that if you can't prove to me that he drowned, then why are we putting drowning on his death certificate? So the the second autopsy was an independent pathologist. Yes, James um, Bryant. James Bryant. Who's Sergio Sarantella? That's, That's the third. The third one. That's the third. Okay, there are three total. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And the thing about it was with Sergio, um, he had to get a piece of skin, um, from the body, um, because if you, I don't know, nobody really seen it, but. He had to grow it mm-hmm. um, because it was right how bad it was. Mm-hmm. And so he had to grow it to be able to perform his DNA test. To make sure that it was Jelani because we still were questioning whether or not the body was Jelani. Mm-hmm. So we had to send that off. Sergio okay. had to send it off to a lab. To have new skin grown. And he didn't even look at... Uh, the LaSalle County coroner's report because he just wanted to have fresh eyes and completely go into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but which, the thing of it is, is, is my thing. What I was that I've always thought when um, they first did the first autopsy, even though the body was like it, they needed to see whatever. Um, I've always wondered why they cut off yeah his 
job on? I've never what heard was, of that. A lot of what the, was the pers- What was the purpose for doing mm-hmm. that? Mm-hmm. Right. James Bryant pointed out a lot of that. We had a a town hall a, a via Zoom um, online one time. And uh, James, he, he spoke a lot about how it was real un, unpractical for uh the way that Jelani's the way they autopsy did that, was done. The way they the way the way he received it in a way they performed it. Perf- yeah. Right. And he said normally this wasn't wouldn't be happening at all. He said and he, he caught him off practice. Mutilated. Right. Yeah. Oh wow. Which it goes back to so do you know was it actually Richard? Or I'm sorry, I keep, I keep confusing Richard with um Richard Plock is the coroner for He's the coroner. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Denton is the, the pathologist. pathologist. Yeah. And What's th- his background? For, is he Scott, does he work for the Scott Denton is supposed to be this well known, he well done, known, renowned oh, really? a lot of them in that forensic area. pathologist. Um so he has a good reputation. He's supposed to have a good reputation. His field. He's very rude also. And but if mm. the, if you um I don't know if you're aware, there were some um emails that were foiled from the coroners. So there's a corner, um, I forget what it's called, but they have a, a kind of like a group chat with a all board. Corners. They have mm. a board also, okay. and the president of the board um, requested to have a um, what they call a panel review of the autopsy, and ask Richard Plock if they could do this a peer review. I'm sorry, they want to do a peer review of the initial autopsy that was done by Scott Denton so that they could quash any of my questions or concerns. And he thought that that would be fair because all the coroners belong to this organization. Sure, sure. And he thought if they did a peer review, had new set of eyes looking at this, proposed this to them that they could look at this, and they denied them to do the peer review. Mm. So... I questioned that, like, why would they deny them that opportunity to do that? Especially if it was going to help them in to, the end. To, solve or, any, to resolve any questions right. or concerns that I may have. Right. This man that requested this was the president of this organization for the coroners. Because of this and because he felt like they were hiding something, he quit. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Mm. He quit. And, and he even put it, he said that he quit because of Jelani. Really? Yes. Wow. Because that would have been something very valuable mm-hmm. if they could have did another a peer review at, at, to look over everything, to check and see, like, okay, why was this performed this way? Mm-hmm. You know, um, why was you, there's just so many things that I have questions on still to this day that it just doesn't make sense. They, um, <laughs> They did. Like I said, there were, and then Scott, there was a, Scott didn't respond to the emails as if he was telling them, and this is me paraphrasing, why are you guys worried about it? Because I got a bill passed in Jelani's name. It's called the Jelani Day Bill. That bill states that if a body is found in the state of Illinois and not identified within the first 72 hours, the FBI has to be notified and they have to become involved. Um, according to Scott Den's response, when the coroners were like, "Okay, she's starting this, and she's now they because they said I was implementing more work. I'm causing that when bodies are found and they're making more calls to the FBI, they're putting more work on them." And he's he, you know, I'm paraphrasing. She didn't do anything but change a sentence. We're already doing this. Why are you guys concerned? I think that just shows that yeah. they're not doing something right. No. And but they're throwing a fit. And thank you so much for clearing up everything when it comes to the autopsies because there is so much in misinformation out there. Um, specifically at the time I remember Chicago Times or Sun Times had referenced the second autopsy report and they wrote an article that took things way out of context. A bunch of false information was spread. And well, let me clear that of, up to uh, organ harvesting and everything. Yeah. Well, let me clear that up to um, the guy that wrote that. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a lot of respect for him. Really? Yes. Um, he, he was actually just trying to make sure and illustrate 
from what we were learning in that autopsy. Okay. That things were done incorrectly or things were done wrong Mm. concerning Jelani. Um, When he said that the eyeballs were missing, he didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't lying. They were missing. Right. Um, When he was talking about how there was no spleen and about the brain and all of that stuff, Mm -hmm. um, the way somebody read it, if you didn't read it correctly, because when I went back and read it, he didn't say that they were, um, it wasn't organ harvesting. That's how somebody took it. But I had to clear that up because there were so many yeah. people saying things about organ harvesting because mm-hmm. they weren't reading the article correctly. Yeah, they didn't have the context. Yeah, yeah. yeah they didn't have the context correctly. But right. that's not what he was implying in there. He was just letting you know the, From the, the death of what was taking place with the second autopsy of what we gotten mm-hmm. back from concerning mm-hmm. Jelani. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah, and plus with the second autopsy that he was like trying to go over with and follow. Even in the report of the second autopsy person, he concluded with his own comment commentary and just saying that he basically saying he doesn't know how the determination of death that they you cannot make a determination of death with this information from this body, especially the way that they did it, trying to say it's drowning. And he couldn't do that as well because of how much damage was done due to that first one. That makes sense. So it should just be everything's unknown, right. undetermined, rather yeah. than, well, we found the body in water, so therefore he we're drowned. putting drowning mm-hmm. there. Yeah. And also, like I said, the things that were done to his body. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, is this, I, my questions were, is this normal procedure? Why were these things done the way that they were done? Why was his body like this? It was already, in my mind, I'm envisioning it was already deteriorated the way that he explained it to us in that room, how he looked and how, what wasn't on his body. Why did you need to, if, if you're not finding anything visible, what did you need to cut his job on out for? Because when I was, there was just something that somebody brought to my attention today that they were talking about when you need to cut a job on out, a jawbone is usually cut out when there's strangulation Mm. to a body mm. yeah, there's some type sense. there's some sort of trauma to the yeah, neck there's the little tiny bones in the neck right yeah so i get crushed exactly so what would be the purpose it, because what no they're purpose. telling us what they're telling us is that there was no visible nothing visible done to the outside they couldn't visibly see anything to the outside of his body so if you don't see determine strangulation what What's the purpose of doing those things to his body? And to me, it just it sounds like that autopsy person basically is trying to cover up for something else, mm-hmm. assisting with somebody else to cover up yeah. the true cause of it. Absolutely. Or at least explain why you did that. You know, at least right. explain what what's the reason for doing that exactly you know and clear that up for for you guys so that Mm -hmm. you understand the purpose of to just go about doing it the way they did and then you know not explaining the process doesn't make any sense and i would i would have the same questions too it'd be like why'd you do that why'd you do this it just yeah it seems it it does seem weird so by this point police and coroner are pretty set on the fact that jelani took his own life that's that's ground. the implication. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's that continues to be the implication. Obviously, you guys do not believe this. We've been over this. Makes absolutely no sense. But at this point, that's really kind of where they're wrapping things up. And it kind of they seem to have stopped investigating at that point, which they claim they still are. But they say this is still an open and active investigation. But she also told us just recently that until they get any significant tips nothing is being done and so you guys had to take it on at that point well i mean you had been up until i've been taking it on um since then um again with after the body was identified after we had the Mm -hmm. service Mm -hmm. and we buried jelani um well actually i didn't bury him after the service that's when I had the third autopsy done. Mm-hmm. Um, we had the barium um, 
We got the bear uh, a little later. A week because, later. Yeah. Because we had the third autopsy done. Right. Then fast forward to November. Mm-hmm. That's when his phone was found on the side of the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about the phone a little bit. Yeah. Um, a young man. Well, I was in the bed one night and my kids run in the room and they say, Mama, they found Jelani's phone. I'm like, how do you know? It was on Facebook. That's how mm-hmm. we found out of Jelani's course. phone was found Once on again, Facebook. No one contacts you. Nobody contacted me. And then I learned that they actually have had Jelani's phone for a whole week. What? They had his phone for a whole week before we even knew that it was on, fa- before we found out about it on Facebook. The um, guy that posted the first post, um, last name is Do. I can't remember what his first name is right now. But um, he put on there that somebody that worked for him found Jelani's phone on the side of the highway um, that the guy had been questioned. So we start trying to contact these people. I get in contact with him. He gives me the number to the guy that actually found the phone. I talk to him. Um, he tells me that the police had his phone. They were going through his phone to make sure that he didn't have anything to do with it, that he found the phone. He pulled over. His This is his story. He pulled over on the side of the road because he was carrying a mattress on the back of his truck that he was delivering to his sister or somebody. And when he pulled over on the side of the road, he saw this phone. Um, the phone was broken. The screen was cracked and everything. <laughs> he went to the Walmart in normal, um, turned the phone in. He got $80 for the phone. Through one of those like little vending machines. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Through one of those kiosks. Um, he turned the phone in and um, he received $80. The phone had been reported stolen. So the police were then alerted when it goes through this process of it going because the phone went all the way to California they have to enter that IMI EI number and everything so of course we've already reported the phone stolen and missing so when the they do whatever they're doing on their end it alerts the police that the phone is here so they then sent for the phone and the phone was mailed back or sent back to Illinois Mm -hmm. that's how we received the phone now I'm curious do you think that the phone was always there in the road where it was found? Or do you think it was put there later? Kendall, I don't know. That's something I don't know because where are they saying they found Jelani's phone at on mm-hmm. the side of this road? I asked this young man when I spoke to him, where, like, was it just sitting, like, on the concrete? And plus it has rained and everything since this time, right? Yeah, right. But Jelani's phone, when the police got it back and they plugged it up, it came on. Well, there you go. It came on. Um, you couldn't see the screen. The screen was broken, but it was, you know, it made the alert noise or whatever. It came on. Mm. Um, so they knew that it, the phone had power to it. He, according to the boy that found the phone, he said he found it in the grass. So I'm just in my mind, and I always think about this. You are securing a mattress on the back of this pickup truck. Mm -hmm. And you say you look over to the side. And you know on the side of the road, the highway, they usually cut the grass. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually trimmed down a bit. Right. How would someone have missed it all that time? This happened in August, and it's now November. So just keep in mind, September, Mm -hmm. October. No way. No way. That doesn't make it. It is. It just. How do you see this phone that's sitting there? If it's there, like you said, it was for this two months. No way. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's just ridiculous. Which it was found off of I-55, which is North Bloomington, on your way to Peru. Uh huh. So it's on the route. That doesn't make sense. Mm -mm. Cause it's rained since then. Right. So, you know, if you, when you get water and stuff in your phone. I mean, it's like three months at that point. Yeah. There's no way. That phone was placed there later, in my opinion. It's so much stuff that doesn't yeah, make sense. Yeah, there's a lot of questions around that. Mm-hmm. Now, kind of going into the future here, but we talked a lot about this yesterday. 
um, for a long time, the phone wasn't able to be unlocked mm -hmm. until recently, last month, correct? In June. No, his phone got unlocked in May. Oh, in May. Okay, in May mm -hmm. of this year. Mm -hmm, of this year. Um, you were looking at, you thought of the security footage of him at the school when he typed his code into the phone on video. I haven't been um, been public about anything that I have been doing. And, oh, we can um, cut this out. No, we can talk Are about you sure? it. Uh -huh. Okay. But um, during that time, I was sitting at work and I was thinking to myself, what am I missing? Mm -hmm. Because I had been contacting Sarah and contacting the the um, joint task force, asking them about what they've been doing. They hadn't been responding to me. Um, so I was sitting at work, and I kept thinking, what am I missing? I was reviewing, like, old videos of interviews that I was doing or looking at some videos of Jelani and I came across this video of when he was at the school and I see him walk up to this desk and then that's when I see him put his code in his phone and I kept rewinding. I was like, oh my God, he's putting his phone, code in his phone. So I cropped it and I sent it to my kids. And I'm like, look y'all, Jelani's putting his code in his phone. But you can't see the last, Jelani's fingers is moving so fast. Right, right. You can't see the code. Pretty I can't distinguish too, yeah. what it is or anything. But finally, I get a meeting with the task force, and I ask them, were they aware of this video? And um, Sarah or Todd, one of them, well, you asking about the video at the, when he's leaving Starbucks? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, we're aware of that video. I said, but do you realize that he's pushing his code in the phone? So it's me that tell them I need to get this video enhanced and Enlarge so we can figure it, out yeah. what the code is. And Ty says, well, Carmen, we can do that. So from the time I asked him to do this, it took them 11 days to unlock his phone. They figured out the code. He called me one on that day. He said, um, I've got some news for you. And I knew you were going to be so mad at me if this didn't work, but I called them because he said he was calling them with different codes. And, um, you know, because if you do it so many times, it'll lock you right, out. Right, right, right. Um, but he called them with this last code, and lo and behold, it opened up his phone. He said, so Carmen, um, he had went and got Jelani's phone from the FBI. He said, I really do, uh, Carmen, I'm, I'm just going to tell you this. I'm just, he said, and I know it's not your fault, but I really do believe if you hadn't have made us take the phone to the FBI, we could have figured this out sooner. Keep in mind, it's a year and a half later. <laughs> it's me that had to bring this to your attention, but you're telling mm -hmm. me now what you could have done sooner. Yeah. yeah. Mm, it's always okay. a deflection that's back on me that I'm supposed, they, they're getting directives from me, but then they don't want to help. Yeah. Me. You right, know what I'm saying? Exactly. So make it make sense. Um, so he um, tells me that they've got to download this information. So when they tell me that they unlocked the phone, I let them know. Save goes down there to Bloomington. Um, Save um, went there. They still wouldn't let him because I wanted, we want to be present right, yeah. when they open the phone. Um, so Save was there. They telling him that they couldn't. They were downloading the information. They say they claim that it only took a an hour or a day. Was it an hour or a day to download the information? Um, it took a couple of hours. They put it on what they forgot what they call it, but it's like a basically oh, right. like a little not a disc, but you just plug it in a computer and you can sort through messages or different applications, stuff mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, he was telling me that he has to go through all that and at the time he said he was the only one doing that. And he said it's over a thousand. Yeah. A thousand megabytes of information. <sighs> so a thousand megabytes? Is that a lot? Or gigabytes? gigabytes. It was gigabytes. It was gigabytes. But, whatever okay. it is, it's a lot. Whatever. Gigabyte. I'm gigabytes would be a lot. Okay. Yeah. So it's the gigabytes. Because if you had like a terabyte, yeah, was it a, it iPhone? Was a 12 Pro Max. Okay. So it was probably a terabyte. So, yeah. So 
thousand oh. gigabytes. Okay, and he said it was going to take a. That's a, a decent amount of just, stuff. Yeah. Right. So I'm That's, like, I was asking, like, are you the, so you're the only one going through this? And he said, yeah, I'm the only one that's going to go through this. It's going to take me a little while to go through it, but I'm going to get through it. And I said, so I was telling him about how Jelani didn't know his way around. And so you can definitely look up, like, on Google Maps or Apple Maps. You can check and see the last All location. All the searches, yeah. Right, before yeah. they searched that. And he said, well, we're not going to go exactly use the phone. We're using this system that we have that we're going to sort through it that way. And uh, we already tried the geolocation with Google. We subpoenaed we uh sent warrants out whatever to them so we can get yeah. your locations right and stuff like that and i said so i said but in the phone i know you're gonna see something different like i kept telling him you're gonna see something different and now weeks later they're telling us here today that it's There's nothing nothing in the phone he they says can't find anything that is of suspicious out of or ordinary. anything out of the ordinary he mm-hmm. she he on may the 13th he kept, t- he called me. Well, I called him. He returned the call to me and, and I asked him, when can we make a date where I can come down there and you can open up the phone and I'm there? And he was yeah. like, oh, Carmen, we haven't set the date yet. And he said, we're still downloading. I really do believe that we can go and we can get deleted information off the phone that what the FBI couldn't have done. We can get way more. My guys are telling me that they can do way more than what the FBI did, that they can get more information they can even get deleted information off of the phone. I said, okay, you've been telling me this for the last two weeks. So when are we going to set a date? He said, Carmen, really, honestly, we haven't found anything on the phone. I said, with all the information that you're telling me that you haven't downloaded off the phone, you haven't found anything? He says, Carmen, there's nothing on the fucking phone. And I said, well, give me the fucking yeah, phone. Yeah, It's unbelievable that he spoke to you that way. And then he says, you know what, Carmen, you're really trying to set me up. You're always trying to set me up. You don't listen. And you know, what? I'm not having this conversation with you. And he hangs up and he hangs up on me. And I haven't spoken to him since May the 13th. We have a meeting with the task force on the first Monday of every month. Mm. On June, the June meeting, he didn't show up. The July meeting, he didn't show up. I asked Sarah in the Zoom meeting, okay, so do we have an update on the phone? She says, well, they Todd sent me some information. I'm going through it. Carmen, there's nothing significant on there. It's just Jelani talking about homework. He's talking about um, his TB test. Um, he's talking about um, just normal stuff. He, there's some text messages to you guys, but... I don't see anything significant. And like I told her, I, maybe you wouldn't know what is significant right. or what to look for. Why not let you look at let it? Let me be there. Well, we're, well, you have to contact Blooming. I'm, I, he's, I, well, matter of fact, I'm going to get with Todd and Carmen. I'll update you. I'll let you know what he says. Okay. The other guy that's on the phone from LaSalle, he has information as well. She says she passed it to him. He tells me that he's looking through it. So this is in June. In July, we get back on the same phone call with them again. And I asked them, so what's the update on the information? Sarah, nobody has contacted me. I said, you emailed me one time and told me about that you were going to contact Todd, that I can meet with you guys. Well, Carmen, we've decided we're not meeting with you. You're not going to be able to see the phone. Why not? Because it's an open and active investigation. I said it was open and active when I gave you the information to find out how to get into the phone. It was open and active when I pointed that out to you that he was punching this code in. It was open and active last month when you told me that you were going through the information. Well, didn't Todd tell you already that um, what he found on the phone? I said he did not. She said, are you sure? I said, I'm positive. Well, Carmen, I'll get back in touch with you. I'll talk to Todd because I can't believe that Todd didn't let you know what was going on on the phone. So I said, well, Sarah, what did you find? That's what she told me. She didn't find anything. I so I asked the other guy from LaSalle, what did he find? Well, I haven't been able to go through everything yet. And plus my computer broke down. So I said, so what is the urgency here? My God. None. They have no urgency. None whatsoever. And then Sarah talks to me as if I'm bothering her. And I have to point that out to her. 
They're just playing around. Yeah. Like I said, there's a bunch of gaslighting. That's all I get. I get gaslighted every time I get on the phone with them. And just listen to the verbiage that they use, like oh, you're yeah. trying to set me up, or a lot of them know that they messed up. That's they know what that it that's is. The whole, they're trying to cover. Now they're trying to cover their tracks and act like yeah. they're doing something more than what they've done before, and they, they're, they're just not. Absolutely. Well, and they're contradicting up. themselves, too. They're like, it's always exactly. a contradiction. There's nothing on the phone of importance, but... Yeah, yeah I a, can't let you see the phone because it's an active investigation, it will even be though better, you helped me be, get in the phone. It will be better if you told me we have this information and it's going to, we're doing whatever we're, we're doing. Processing we're processing it. We're processing it. And, yeah. and Carmen, but we can't let you have it because it's, you know, it's leading to whatever it's leading to. Right. It gave us a new lead that we're looking at or something. No, but yeah. they told me they don't have any leads. Yeah, you would think they'd try to give us some type of comfort in that. Yeah. but. Or get yeah. your help. Exactly. Like if you're not getting anywhere with right. this, why not bring you guys in? You yeah. know Jelani way better than they do. So let you look at his And that's messages. what I told them. That's what I told them. She said, there's not anything. I said, you wouldn't even know what to look at the yeah. love of significance. Yeah. Obviously, when I find something, because I pointed out to you like many different times about things that were of significance. Like you guys, I said, I had to point out to you that he was punching his code in the phone. You didn't think that was significant. You had the same video longer than I had. I've had to point that out to you. So obviously you do need me to point out things that you to show you things. So when you look through this phone, something that you might not think that is significant, it may be strange to us because we know him. I don't see why they wouldn't want your help on that. Mm. Unless they're trying to cover their tracks yeah. for something mm -hmm. or multiple things or who knows. Who knows? Because it's that's the only strange. thing I can keep coming up with now. Because what are you hiding from me? Yeah. You, we all want, you say that your, your ultimate goal is mine, is the same as mine. You want to find out what happened to Jelani, but it doesn't appear that that's the way that that's what you're doing. Can we talk about his journal that was found? Have you seen the journal yourself? Mm hmm And there were only like two entries in it, right? From 2021. I mean, he started it back in 2016, correct? Mm. I'm not sure when he probably started it. But. Yep, it's, it's like 2016, 2015, something like that. Okay. Yeah, that was enough. Okay. Jelani wrote things down. Jelani yeah. used to always, the, well, one of the things that I used to have them do when they were younger was journal. Jelani and Dakar were the one that mainly did a lot of journaling. Okay, but there, there was only two entries from 2021, from that year. Mm -hmm. There was one or two. One or two. It's, okay. it is. Mm -hmm. And there yeah. was no suicide note or anything that resembled anything no. like that. No. In his journal, Jelani discussed um, how if he didn't do good on a test and he was so hard on himself, like, I should have did this and I didn't study hard or mm. I'm disappointed in myself for doing this. And this was like in 2016, 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So, um, it's like a self-reflection Very book. normal, I mean. You know, self-reflecting yeah. on his day or week or what he's been doing. Mm. Or if he made a mistake about something, he was like, God, I didn't mean to disappoint you. I got to do better with my life yeah. and stuff like that. Very typical entries. But the entries from they the not recent... They didn't want us to look at that journal at all. We didn't see that journey. Like, they didn't even tell us about it. Cause we asked them questions about, did you find anything like this um, in this car or anything like that? Um, and they denied it until we had finally had the meeting with them. I forgot what time frame that was, but we had the meeting with them, and they finally showed us the video of him coming in, entering and exiting the uh, dispensary. And that's when they uh, explained to us about the, uh, the whole journal. And um, things like that, we felt like we should have been known about. Oh, yeah. We should have been. Well, why not? Why like, why not tell you guys everything that they know mm -hmm. when they know it, right? Mm -hmm. like, it's just, there's there's something weird for why they're not, they haven't been straight up with you guys from the beginning. What can you tell us about the radio from his car? I know that that. The radio from his car was supposed to um, contain a chip in it. That would have been able to um, tell you where he had been. Yeah. So because of the year of his car, you know, um, 
I guess the radio is supposed to have like some kind of GPS chip yeah. in it, right? Um, they took the radio out of his car and they said they sent it to Quantico. Mm -hmm. But they <laughs> said that they didn't find anything in it. So Oh, so they did look. I heard it was on a two-year backlog. I heard that too. That's why I didn't understand why they had it back already. Hmm. So more just confusion and barely any answers. I did want to. I did want to put out there though, because I know some people might be wondering. They did do a toxicology report because mm -hmm. obviously one of the things someone might say is like maybe Jelani had a mental breakdown or you know just broke mm -hmm. down and you know right. or he took something, took a substance or something, and then you know he went into the to river. But there was no other than. Cannabis, caffeine, caffeine and, and cannabis was found in his yeah. system. Very caffeine difficult. from he went to Starbucks. Right, right, right. Cannabis, he went to the dispensary. Right. So, but nothing that would cause you to, you know, have an episode or anything like that. No. And ha drown yourself. Has anyone else come forward saying that they spoke to Jelani in the days leading up, or given you any like vital information, or talked to him specifically on the twenty fourth? No. Nothing. When DeAndre went to his apartment, did he? Did you guys get a hold of his personal laptop and and look through that at all to see yeah. see if there's any searches or anything on there? Yeah, um, that <clears throat> that day when we finally got an apartment, it was the next day, and we was all searching around through it, and I'm the one who took the laptop initially. Um, he he had another one that was in his car, but I knew that wasn't the right one because he just bought a new laptop, and that was his old one. So I had to, we, we all looked through it. We looked through emails and see if there was anything in there like of that nature. But all that it had was um, stuff from like his summer class before he got his new laptop. And um, it wasn't, then we tried to go into, um, that's when we tried to also go into Apple because with his Apple information, he, he would have a lot of music. His iTunes was on there too. Mm -hmm. So um, I would, tr I tried a couple of different ways to try to mimic his phone with my phone. Got a different SIM card from Verizon, put it inside mine. Mm -hmm. um, tried to reset the password so I can at least get into it, but none of that worked. But then we also tried to um, do what is, so basically if, if you put this SIM card in your phone, all this other messages started popping up. That he that he that he didn't get right. So voicemails popped up, all those, and so um, we went through all of them, and it was just basically like some of his friends reaching out to him, saying, "Hey, Jelani, it's me. Please reach out to us. We're looking for you." Um, a lot of different type of those messages, and um, m numbers that we didn't know, we would call them. We would call them and see, okay, uh, how did you know Jelani? Who are you to Jelani? Why'd you text him this? We a list of numbers that we all went through. And then kind of find out Jelani changed his number. So it was a woman who had Jelani's phone number. And she was getting messages from oh. Jelani's old number. So, oh, wow. So let's clear that up. The number that Seve is referring to. So the number that Jelani had when he went missing was the one that Seve cloned the, the SIM cards. Okay. But the, the Jelani had changed his number within the last month and the girl or maybe it was a little bit longer but there was a girl that was getting text messages to her phone because she ended up having jelani's old phone number gotcha okay. and so um she ended up finding me um connecting with a person that knew me and finding me and um she came to the house and she was showing us the numbers that were coming through to the phone. Yeah, she let us get her phone and go through all the messages, text mm -hmm. her phone. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's no banking activity, credit card activity on no. the day he goes missing. No. There's no, and well, we don't know if his car's been picked up on cameras along the highways and stuff like that. You guys And there been... are cameras on the oh, highways. Oh yeah, on the they're, interstates, they're... absolutely. Yeah. The, and what I don't understand for the life of me is, um, so they say his phone loses service at 921, right? Mm -hmm. And at 921 is when 
he deletes everything off his phone is what they say. Hmm. He deletes, um, turns off his um, Jeep, what is it, um, his locations on everything. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this video because he sat in that car uh, maybe about five, six minutes before he pulled off out of that parking lot. It takes longer than that to delete all this stuff. You got all this stuff on your phone. Mm -hmm. Jelani had videos of us from, shoot, 10 years ago that he kept in his cloud. So I'm thinking if he keep, because he keeps videos, he keeps pictures. He, he likes to make memes and make fun of everybody. <laughs> Why would he delete? It? Why would yeah. he delete? No his location off of everything. Why would he, no. why would, and how, how do you do that in a matter of minutes? Yeah. How do you delete your, you got Snapchat, you got all these different apps. So my thing of it is, if you know that much about what he was doing, you can't tell me anything else. Right. So, um, there's so many questions that I have. There's so many unanswered things because Nothing about Jelani's phone makes sense. No. Nothing. Where it's found. Where it's contents. found, what's the contents on it, what's not on there, what they're saying that they did find on there. Um, none of it makes sense. Did he did he use cannabis like regular was that wasn't his like first time? No. Okay. No. Okay. I just want to clear that up. Too, no, no, no. It was not. Um, I used. I tell him all the time, "You too smart to be sm to be killing your brain cells all the time." <laughs> He'd be like, "Mom, no, I'm not. I'm not killing my brain cells." But no, that wasn't his okay. first time. Just I know people would. That's would why want to know that. when he went to the to the dispensary, that wasn't nothing that alarmed me either. Okay. Then, like I told the police, I would rather him have bought it. At the store, then I bought it on the street. So now, what are we doing? Let's look mm -hmm. for him. I don't care about him smoking weed. Yeah. Okay. There's just so many questions. So many. I I think it's when you look at everything as a whole. I think Peru is just the big, the big question mark. It's like, why was he in Peru? Mm -hmm. What what drew him up there? Did somebody take him up there? Did he drive up there to meet somebody? Or was he brought out up there? Yeah, or was he after? brought up there against his own or against his will? That's a possibility if somebody was in the car. Cuz like you said, I think you brought up a really good point. Where his car was found is is a very important piece of of evidence mm -hmm. that it was in this area that unless you live there or frequent in that area, you wouldn't know that that area existed or would have parked your car there. When I've spoken to people that live in Peru that um, that either stopped us when we were there or have sent me messages, they've told me about how that area is a place like kids take shortcuts to go to. Mm. There's a school over there that kids walk through there to take shortcuts because um, um, there's a path that you can walk through there. Um, that That was a place where when kids wanted to go make out or something, they hid back okay. in there and stuff like that. So that's something that you have to be in that town to know that, to yeah. know about that. Right. Not if he's so, never been not, in that town. Not if you've never been in that town. Not if you've never been there. You, you, if you see that, you would never, you would never just be somebody riding off the street because you got to go, you got to turn corners and come in a neighborhood mm -hmm. to get to that local YMCA. It's not just off the highway. It's none of that. It's in a neighborhood, in the, in the center of where houses are. Jelani's not going in there to hide his car on purpose. To what? Go for a for swim? For what? Like, it doesn't make any sense. No. And no. then to throw his wallet down and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ditch his phone and that That's doesn't... It's so confusing. There's just endless answers that you guys need. And this is really where you as the audience can step in and, you know, make those requests because this family needs help. They need to be taken more seriously. You need these answers. I mean, I don't know how much longer, you know, how can you continue on life without 
at least knowing. I know that has to be, we talked about this yesterday, how it's the most painful thing in the world to just not know. If it was something else where you had a definitive answer, of course, it's devastating, it's heartbreaking, but to to live with all of these questions looming through your head every day is is torture. It is. It's the it's the unknown that is the worst. Yeah. Like I told you yesterday, if he had a been in a car accident or mm-hmm. you know, gotten shot or something, I know yeah. why he's right. not here. You know, I know how he passed away. I don't have any of that. No. I don't have any of that. And that's a struggle every single day. It's it's um it's really hard to um you know, I, I the only way I can visit him is to go to his gravesite. Mm. And um before this happened with Jelani, I hate gravesites. Mm-hmm. I hate graveyards. I wouldn't even walk on them because I always felt like I was walking on top of people. But now I have to go out there and I sit out there with him, talk to him. I have to clean up off his tombstone and stuff. So, um, and I'm when I'm there, I'm always like, I don't know why I got to come out here to see you, but I'm here because that's the only place I can see him at. You know, and um, and I know they say that you know, that's where his his body is, right? Because his his spirit is there. Sometimes that's where I feel closest to him. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it's certain things happen, and like for his birthday, I was at I was at work in Belleville. And um, I had to leave work and drive three hours in because I didn't want him to be by himself on his birthday. At first, I was like trying to tell myself, Carmen, it's okay. But it wasn't okay. And that's what I don't think that I just want the task force to understand that this is not okay. I can't, um, it's a struggle to, um, to function. I have to talk to myself all the time for me to be okay. And, um, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Not easy. Not knowing the answers. It's not easy that every time I turn around, that when I'm asking them for assistance, it's a struggle to get that assistance from them. As I've told them and I'm telling them again, and if they're watching this, I would never wish this upon any of them. And if this was to happen to them, how would they want to be treated by the authorities that are supposed to help them? I ask them to put themselves, if they can't, sympathize with me, at least empathize with me, put themselves in my shoes, they wouldn't want to lose their child, someone they have birthed, that they helped raise, that they wanted to see grow and become that man or woman that they look forward to seeing, watching them become. And then something happens to them And nobody can explain to you nothing. It ain't like I know that he was in a boat and he fell over or any of that. Last time I see my son alive is he's walking in a store. And he appears to be fine. Nothing is wrong with him. When I talked to him, nothing was wrong with him. Then he just disappears in thin air and you did nothing. Like like you didn't look at the, ca- there was cameras all around. Like you could have retrieved video in a timely manner that 
when we go back, these businesses are telling us, well, we tape over it after this many days or we don't retain the footage or none of that. When Paul Jones was supposed to have been out there doing this, I know you're only one person, but you were assigned to this case. And for me, you should have took your jobs more serious, especially when you were on the case for one day. You found his car is missing. I mean, then you find it. So obviously you should know that there's something wrong here. Mm -hmm. And try to retrace the steps. No, I had to retrace steps. I retraced steps. I, I went to a Dollar General and sat in there for six hours and watched their videotape and to tell them like I see Jelani's car here and them Carmen will send somebody there tomorrow to retrieve it and then they want to say thank you <laughs> it's all just um it's um it's disrespectful I've always I tell them this all the time that they're disrespectful they are and that's putting it nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Especially for some of the others involved with this case that have spoken to you and the things they've said. Honestly, should be fired, in my opinion. I mean, completely uh, yeah. unprofessional. It's un unbelievable. It is. Um, but hopefully, um, as I continue to push forward and we continue to, um, Put pressure on them. We'll get answers. I do believe that I'm going to find out what happened to Jelani. And whoever is responsible for whatever reason, um, they will be held accountable. I believe that too. Somebody out there's gotta know something. I mean there's yeah, oh somebody does somebody knows somebody something. Mm -hmm. They just really good right now as keeping their mouth closed. They haven't talked as much as they want to, but you know Somebody gonna slip up. They're yeah. gonna they're gonna talk. They're gonna say something. Mm -hmm. We're gonna find something. Um like I told the task force, I'm not going away. Mm -mm. So either y'all work with me <laughs> cause I'm not going anywhere. You don't have a choice. It's getting ready to be two years and it seems like it's been like this just happened yesterday sometime. Mm -hmm. um, in this process of me talking to the Joint Task Force, like I said, people have gotten promoted. Um, people have taken on other jobs. And my frustration is like, they just, for, Jelani is just another number. Mm hmm When I watched the video with Sarah chuckling when they asked her about Jelani, it infuriates me so much. We'll insert that. Jelani Day, what can you share with me? I can share with you that um, it is still an open and active investigation. That... It is a death investigation to this point. Um, As opposed to? Um, you, you could call it a crime, you could call it something else, but we just don't have any factual information to say that it is anything other than a suspicious death at this point. There's just so many things um, that they, um, like I said, that they don't seem like it's important. They don't want to question the girls. They don't want to question Kara. They don't want to, the, the friends. It's like. They don't want to investigate. No, they don't no. want to do anything. They don't want to do any investigation. They don't want to do no. No. And that's why as many people as possible need to contact them, need to put pressure on them. There's, uh, you can call, you can send an email. Um, we'll even put their Twitter so you can um, light them up that way. But please, guys, we really we really need to put the pressure on and let people know that we haven't forgotten about Jelani Day. We want answers and they're not off the hook. And that 
you're never giving up. We're all never giving up. Um, also, there is a tip line. Um, we'll have all this information in the description box, but you can submit tips anonymously to 1-800-CALL-FBI. And the FBI is offering up to $10,000 for substantial information. And your family is also offering up to $25,000 in reward money, um, which, you know, we would love to add to that if, if that's how you would, you know, want to use our donation, but that's completely up to you. Um, we can discuss that later. Um, but is there anything else that you guys want to touch on or anything else you want to say to our audience? I just want the audience to know that I appreciate all of you. Um, Jelani could have been your son, your nephew, your brother, your cousin, your grandson. He deserves better. He deserves a lot better. The uh, support and the prayers are so very well needed. And I just want to thank you for uh, being supportive alone this way. We ask that you continue to support us, continue to pray for us, um, because we will have justice for Jelani one day. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys so much for coming on and yeah. sharing with with everybody. Just uh, this hits deep, man. It's just like you said, it could be anybody's brother, mm -hmm. anybody's loved one, friend, and it and, can, can happen to anybody too. Yeah, and and losing Jelani like is such a loss to your family. Obviously, his friends, but it's a loss to the world. Who's going to help many people? Yeah, losing Jelani. Um, like I said. The people responsible for this don't understand how they affected and impacted mm -mm. my family at all. Mm -mm. Because when we lost Jelani, like I said, we lost his dad. Mm -hmm. And you hurt my kids in such a way that I'm trying, I really am trying to be, or I'm trying not to hate the person or individuals that did this. Because, yeah, you hurt me because you really took a piece of me. But when I look at my kids and when I see how they, what they've had to endure, like I said, my, my biggest thing is to protect them. And um, they robbed us. They did. They robbed us. They did. Well, this is the reason that we first started the foundation. Um, everything we went through, um, we didn't imagine going through it. And just seeing everything that's happened in the world today, we don't want to see nobody else go through it. And so, if, unfortunately, our story has to be the one to help us get this type of change or uh, motivate or inspire others who have ever dealt with something like this to get up and speak or be active or vocal. Um, I truly do hate that we have to be the ones to um, endure that type of uh, endure that type of thing. But if it is to help and make change with safety or policies on universities or law enforcement reform things like that, then um, at least we get to help. And make sure this doesn't happen. Uh, more so, more safer place for other people and other students. Mm -hmm. That says, I think, so much about your family. That in your time of need, after everything you've been through, you you want to help others. And I know that's driven by Jelani, too, and his need to help others as well. Yeah. Um, in some sort of way, it does help us a lot to know that we're helping other yeah. people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, it's it's a it's a it's a purpose that um, it, it makes us feel like we're doing something, even when we don't have the answers. I know for me, this being able to help somebody, it, it sometimes it's a um, 
it's a comfort or something that soothes me to know that yeah. I can be able to do something, even though I don't know everything about my child yet. Mm-hmm. Well, you guys are doing an amazing job. And I know our audience is going to have a lot of um, kind words and support for you in the comments. And we thank you guys in advance. Um, Absolutely. Thank you again for joining us today. It really means a lot. Thank you for having you, us. For yeah, sure. I wish it was on different different circumstances, of course. <sighs> yeah. I, I always hate to be like, you know, thank you guys for coming and, you know, we're doing this this podcast and everything, but we we really do appreciate you guys mm-hmm. coming on and, you know, sharing sharing your story and allowing us to to be a part of it and help help out in any way that we can. So we'll definitely send everybody to to your, the foundation to the gofundme to to all the different places yes um they'll be below in the description mm-hmm. if you're watching Everything, on youtube shirts gofundme petition um call to action as far as making those calls and sending those emails that's going to be absolutely vital um so we thank you all in advance um that's going to be it for us today everyone uh, we'll be back next week but until then keep on taking your mind a mile higher